From the center of the galaxy, this is Force Center, a show about Star Wars, pop culture, and the ultimate adventure, life itself. Incredibly nuanced, complex, often tragic, life itself. I'm Joseph Scrimshaw. I'm Ken Afsack. Don't get me laughing already at the outside Star Wars world and world. Don't bring those complications <laughs> into my Star Wars. <laughs> They're here. They're here. Okay. They're here. We cannot ignore them. And I am Jennifer Landa, ready to dive in. Yeah, we're going to dive into so much complexity, but, but first something just simple and beautiful. We're going to do a live stream. Uh, we're going to do a live stream this Friday, July 12th. Is that how dates work? Yes. Uh, July 12th at 2 p.m. Pacific. Uh, we planned this a while back because we thought it'd be really fun to have uh, one more chance to talk about the Acolyte before the final episode get lots of uh, questions and opinions and thoughts and fun discussion and banter about what all will happen, what all will be wrapped up, all that kind of stuff. So if you're interested in that, again, that uh, live stream is Friday, July 12th at 2 p.m. Pacific. Uh, any thoughts on that, Ken? Uh, no, can't uh, wait to uh, talk to you all there. Uh, as uh, what's kind of our, our, our normal, we'll probably take some calls, but we'll have a specific question we'll cook up for you to call in and answer. That. Yeah. Oh, man, it's going to be fun to come up with the uh, specific uh, question. About, I have an uh, idea. We'll talk out there. Okay, I have an good. idea to, to streamline the conversation. Okay, good, good. Is it going to be asking everyone to sing uh, the song Power of Two? I think that would be fun. <laughs> no. No, okay. No. We'll talk about that. <laughs> anyway, we are going to dive into a very complex episode that I've, people have been waiting for. It's been teed up by the show for weeks now. Season one, episode seven, entitled Choice, uh, which is clearly paired with episode three, which was entitled Destiny. So you can add the slash in your own mind, destiny slash choice. Uh, this was uh, written by Charmaine DeGrat and Jen Richards and Jasmine Flournoy. And uh, just like episode three, directed by Coconata. Uh, we've been talking a little bit about some of the new names in Star Wars. We discussed a little bit about uh, who Coconata was and uh, his life experiences when we talked about episode three and his previous work. Uh, Jasmine Flournoy also wrote on episode uh, three, uh, a writer who is uh, was a PA on the Heathers reboot uh, and a writer's assistant on Falcon and Winter Soldier and getting into the big time here with these great writing credits on these complex episodes here in the Acolyte. Uh, names that I don't believe have uh, popped up yet. Uh, the, uh, the writer, Jen Richards, who is an actor as well as a writer, is an actor. She's appeared on shows like Mrs. Fletcher, Blind Spot, Better Things, and a lot of different shows since 2016. And as a writer, uh, she's got a lot of credits uh, going back to 2016 as a consultant, uh, working on a short film script, a couple TV shows. But the Acolyte also looks like uh, the the big uh, credit on the old IMDb as a writer right now. She's also a vocal activist. Here's a sentence from her Wikipedia page. In June uh, 2017, Richards wrote and appeared in a video open letter presented by Screen Crush in Glad featuring trans actors asking for better representation in film and television. And then the uh, other writer, Charmaine DeGratte, uh, is an uh, Emmy-nominated writer and producer. Credits include Daisy Jones and the Six, Game of Thrones, House of the Dragon, Ken. You're rolling in House of Dragon writers. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Star Wars Acolyte uh, went to Vassar College, where she uh, uh, was a intern, uh, a congressional Sorry. intern in Washington, D.C., and graduated in political science and English literature. Now I just sound like I'm doing the introductions on like a, a game show. Like, yeah, <laughs> and, yeah, no, and now she's going to play Jeopardy. <laughs> anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I'm laughing. Vassar College was almost too key to my life where I uh, really? almost almost moved to Poughkeepsie for a girl that was going to Vassar. So glad I didn't. Anyway, <laughs> this intro went places. It really did. It really did. Anyway, uh, uh, she's uh, uh, had uh, uh, writing credits as well, obviously, as we listed in uh, moving on here to Acolyte. Uh, all right. So, it, Ken, or any thoughts on uh, these writers? Uh, no, I love I love that you've been doing this. I, I think it, this show has been bringing a lot of new names to Star Wars. It's great. And, yep, I'm a huge Game of Thrones fan. The second season, House of Dragon, is uh, proving to be one of my favorite seasons in the world of Westeros and Essos. And mm. uh, she's had a key part in the show, writer-producer, uh, mm. part of that uh, writer's room, and um, and handled some some of the bigger stuff last season, too, that was uh, – yeah, we'll we'll get into it on another podcast. But I, I'm glad <laughs> she's here. She, I think she's really good, and I love to see it. 
Oh, that's great. Uh, Jennifer, any thoughts on these writers or uh, this being a this and episode three being so paired and both directed by the same director? Mm, yeah, that, that made, when I saw his name, I went, oh, yes, OK, uh, that um, that makes sense. Uh, the tone was there. But yeah, I love I love all these fresh new writers who are not necessarily fresh. They are they've been in the business doing other things. But it's just nice to see a variety and just not the the same stable of uh, talent or behind the scenes creators coming into the fold. It's really, really refreshing. Yeah, it's been really fun for me to dive in and see just like how rich and complicated and impressive uh, people's lives and experiences are. And several of these writers are quite young in their writing career. I don't know how mm -hmm. old the actors are, but several of them are quite quite young in their writing career and the accolade is a big break. And to me, uh, is somebody ha who has been grinding around <laughs> in, in, uh, in Hollywood and have many friends who have uh, as well at various ages. It's just a nice reflection always that, you know, the, the IMDB list of credits does not tell this whole story of how experienced and complicated and knowledgeable people are. And talented. And talented. <laughs> there's, a good, yeah. <laughs> there's a good word to include. Yeah. All right. Uh, let's dive into this episode. Uh, so, Jennifer, what was your overall reaction with this episode? Uh, love it, like it, struggle with it, feel like it, it paid off on all of the promises to finally tell us what really happened. Oh, my gosh. I was rocked during this episode. <laughs> I was thrown off balance multiple times. I was on the verge of tears during certain sections. I was literally writing, what the F? what the F <laughs> with all these different choices uh, that people were making. And I was like, this is just a, this is a tragedy on so many levels. And everyone has the best intentions, well, except mm. for certain people, everyone has the best intentions and it just fall. It just goes off the rails. Oh, what a tragedy. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I love that. I love that. And, uh, and can uh, relate to that uh, as well in terms of my reaction, but Ken, what was your overall reaction? Uh, Jen nailed it on Crow. You just did the whole review in like five sentences. It's great. And the fact that you're unbalanced, I think, is important to what's going on in this episode <laughs> here, too. No, I think this was a deliciously complicated episode uh, and it had some very, at times, I thought, uncomplicated clarity buried beneath all that. But sometimes you have to dig to find it. I think there was a little bit of justice for the Jedi, something important to Star Wars uh, soul here, or Force Center soul here. But also, uh, you know, again, as we dig in, we, we, we dig in on all the choices. And Jen, you said it, and you said it right. Tragic. Uh, up and down this story so I, I, I liked it and, and this entire series uh, this entire episode I think f there's this kind of conversation going around on what the show is is doing what the show is presenting what the show is tearing down or looking at with a, a new scope and I think it is doing all those things I think Star Wars can change the questions but I think the it never changes its answers and this episode for me had some of that clarity on the bigger answers in Star Wars. But it doesn't mean it is uh, not, like I said, deliciously complicated. Wonderful acting performances here with this episode. Jody Turner-Smith, Carrie Ann Moss, bringing some of my favorite performances in Star Wars recently in this particular episode. Jody Turner-Smith uh, and her were great in episode three, but this one just uh, kind of stuff I've been looking for from Star Wars actors, and they delivered. Yeah, no, I would I'd really agree with that. I think my real big picture thing, big picture reaction to it is I feel like it, it delivered exactly what the show has been uh, uh, hinting at, uh, not just in events, what happened, but in this sort of uh, game with the audience where the mm -hmm. uh, theme idea has been set since the trailers where we listened to Soul tell younglings, like, reach out with your feelings. <laughs> Don't trust your eyes. Your eyes can deceive you. Uh, mm -hmm. that I feel like the show in, continues to put duality everywhere and mm -hmm. just putting duality in these binary choices, uh, who's right, whose team are you on in front of us, tempts us into just rushing to a judgment and picking a side where the the truth is incredibly uh, uh, nuanced. Everything is messy and complicated and it takes a lot of intuition and a lot of gathering of knowledge uh, to, I think even for the audience to come to a, a sort of emotional conclusion. And I think it's very, uh, it, it's, it is real world in a lot of ways in that not necessarily for like one-to-one -one comparisons, there's mm -hmm. plenty of those interpretations, but just the reality that, oh man, I think we all pine for sometimes situations that are clear <laughs> because mm -hmm. there's 
safety and comfort in it. And there's a lot of situations in here where I feel like they aren't uh, necessarily simple and clear. Um, I really agree with the, the word tragedy. That was like a huge thing for me. Watching this episode took me back to high school in particular, where I was in a program where the only thing we studied for three years of my high school uh, was tragedies, Shakespeare and Greek tragedies. And so I had a lot of times, particularly in like awkward growing up ages, 14, 15, 16, 17 years old, where we would read Romeo and Juliet or, you know, Oedipus or Macbeth. And then we'd have these round table discussions led by teachers with strong opinions, asking 15 year olds, all right, who effed up? Who made the choice <laughs> where there was no going back? And to see how much when we look at a tragedy like this, we're so deeply informed, not only by the, the, our intuition and the evidence of the story, but also our life experiences. You know, there'd be kids who'd be like, it's Macbeth's fault for, you know, listening to the witches. And other kids being like, it's entirely the witch's fault. Just like it's mm -hmm. my mom's like, okay, well, I think, <laughs> I think maybe you're bringing something personal into your interpretation of Macbeth. So watching mm -hmm. the show really brought me back to my uh, uh, early experiences with, with complex stories that are about tragedy that are about people who mostly have good intentions mm -hmm. and or understandable fears, trying to make good choices, trying to de-escalate and escalating again and again and again. It particularly reminded me of Romeo and Juliet, where it is two sides in conflict. There's a little bit of a balance and then there's escalation and escalation and escalation. And when you ask people, they're like, well, that person murdered this person's, you know, friend. They have to respond that way, do they? And they, all that kind of stuff I was really reminded of. And I, and I felt the episode was really powerful in that way. Yeah, no, I know. We're going to get into the, the themes, but the, the, the choices you talk about, you know, the choices that, that go take you to that. You can't turn back or can't go back, not turn back. You can't go back. And even if you do, like, even if Kylo needs to make a decision to maybe do I did I make a mistake? Do I go back to Leia? Like you're going to go back different. You're never going to go back to the same. And it just keeps moving forward. And this episode just tragically kept moving forward. Mm hmm. Yeah. And, and I will say just I think this episode uh, on a craftspersonship level is really well directed. Uh, I, I watched it three times and I was just as deeply engrossed all three times. It flew by all three times. I thought it was particularly just acted and filmed and edited well to make us feel what the characters were feeling, to make us feel the tension. So I thought it was uh, particularly uh, well done. Uh, everybody's been talking about this as well, but I, I also just love that this episode is, um, it, it is like the, the, you know, the truths we cling to depend greatly on our point of view. It's that, you know, very old Obi-Wan quote as a full episode of Star Wars mm -hmm. storytelling and yeah. the, the game that was played with episode three, only showing us parts of it. I, I really appreciated that as a, is an experience. All right. Let's dive into the big ideas, the big themes. Uh, Ken, what uh, what kind of ideas did you start with? Where did you go? Yeah, I approached it uh, in a general sense in themes, and I just uh, one of those episodes I started writing down almost every line in every episode. So bear with me as I as I work through it here. But I think this is uh, very you know we tap the sign every week duality. Uh, we tap the sign every week about choices, and hey, the title kind of made it clear. And the idea of destiny versus choice is going to come up a lot here. I also put down the the, the roadmap. Uh, to escalation is a key in this episode, and the next choice is always yours to make, as complicated and as difficult and as unclear as it might seem at the time. It's always uh, uh, yours to make, and I think it's important to to pull back and see the complete picture. There's so many times where Indara and even Mother Anasea, I do believe, who I think are, you know, you got you got you got Soul and and you got Chimer. The stranger kind of, you know, to me, that's the duality kind of connection there. And I think you, you absolutely got Indara, Mother Anasea, kind of um, two characters tied to the same kind of, of position, I think. And and all through this, um, they're kind of saying those things of, hey, we, we don't know the whole picture. Or here's my intentions. Hey, <laughs> uh, no, I said no to that. I said no to that because that will cause you're not you're, 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 you're not taking care of the consequences. You're not considering the consequences that showed up so many times. So that's where I start the overall picture. 
uh, of that. And, and then there also was a, one of the things I want to get out before we dive in is, is the dream sequence or the possession sequence, I should say, was um, – one of my favorite scenes of this episode and of the series, but all that, this idea of uh, denying oneself for the greater good, uh, which also is a little bit, May has misread her mother's words and, and misquoted her a bit and put the wrong information out there, which is something we'll talk about. But I love kind of the stuff with uh, Torben and this idea of like, what do you really want? Why are you stopping yourself? And that that connects to Soul, that connects to some of the stuff has been saying, kind of the stuff the whole episode has, has been about. And when, when there should be maybe some personal sacrifices uh, not actual sacrifices made, but personal <laughs> sacrifices to parts of our desires for the greater good. All at play in this episode where uh, tragedy erupts. No, I, I really agree with a lot of the big picture things. Uh, I, one of the categories of lists I made is just like, uh, where were there misunderstandings or incomplete information? <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, because that is so key uh, to all of these things. I think there's a ton of great stuff about choice and, and agency. I think the Torben scene is fantastic and really connects to the conversation that uh, Osha and Chimere were having last time about the idea mm-hmm. of desire and seduction being large, complicated words that that can be explicitly directly sexual, but are also much larger uh, and complicated than just like just that. Mm-hmm. Just like intimacy last week was coded sometimes, I think, as explicitly sexual and sometimes as a much wider, larger thing. So I think there's a ton of interesting mm-hmm. stuff to discuss there. Um, uh, Jennifer, what what did you respond to most in the episode? And then we can dive into some uh, details. The biggest thing for me I wrote down was like colonization, really. It's about forcing w- what you believe, it, your beliefs on someone else based on what you deem is right and what you are seeing as wrong. And something I've been studying in school <laughs> is the difference between a difference and a disorder. Disorder is something that you want to treat. A difference is just something that's just different and and it enriches our society and it means that you might have to accept other cultures and that's a good thing. And I think here, uh, Master Soul is seeing the cult as a disorder that needs to be treated. These children need to be saved. And that, and my instinct is that's wrong. Stop it. The Jedi were right. And that made me feel so much better that they were like, no, just leave them be. Like, we've already interfered enough. And I'm like, yes, you have. Get out of there. I just thought that 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 made me feel so much better. And especially with Endara, who's like, like, soul, you're letting your emotions get the best of you. Like, you don't know what's right for this child to rip her away from her family. Oh, that was such a fist pumping moment. And it also connects back to her death and where she she had this expression on her face, Carrie Ann Moss. And I was like, what is that about? It was almost like an acceptance that this choice was going to come back to haunt her, whatever, whatever mm-hmm. she had made. Right. And mm-hmm. it was just like, I can see she's just going along like we're making bad choices here. Soul is making bad choices and she can't she can't rein him in. Um, but yeah. Colonization was a was a big thing for me. Yeah, no, I think it's an important conversation. Uh, I'm curious about your take now that you've seen kind of both sides of it, of how OSHA's choice plays into it, because I think there's lots to discuss about. Yeah, and I don't want to have a big discussion about what is truly motivating Saul. So looking at it from the Saul perspective is one thing. I'm really I continue to be affected by the show seems to have worked really hard to establish that before soul even got involved, Osha did not want to do the Ascension. True. All of this happens because she's out there by the beautiful tree longing to explore things. She wants to meet other children, um, it, 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 which is in, is in no way to absolve any choices that Saul or the other Jedi made. But how do you feel with, with what the show is dealing with in terms of trying to be very, very clear about Osha wanted something different. Mother Anasea even saw it and it was going to fight her own community to give Osha that choice. For you, how, how are you feeling about that now that we've seen that all play out? I think Indara was, was right and that Soul did kind of coach her. If we're looking at this from an assessment point of view, he's like <laughs> leading her into this. He's like almost like not convincing her, but like he's like, you want this. You need to be strong. That's kind of manipulating her. Like I think that she really does not want to 
to do the ascension. And I think she's not really sure about what she wants. She just knows that she wants something more than what she has right now. Whether that is with the Jedi, sure, that's a fun fantasy. But as I said in weeks before, I'm like, kids have a lot of fun fantasies. Let her go take a Jedi class. Let her go to <laughs> Jedi camp, right? Let her let her try it out. And then, you know, she can make up her mind when she's a little bit older. It also makes me think about why, like, they obviously take younglings is because th then you can just, you know, uh, form them into <laughs> these beliefs. And they're much more malleable as opposed to a, a teenager or tween. Um, but, yeah, I really... That, that scene really kind of made me feel uncomfortable because the way that he treated May was very different and much more, I thought, um, fair and unbiased. Whereas with Osha, it was, he was like really like emotional face to face with her. Like it was just more like, you want this, don't you? Yes, you have to do what's right. And it's like, mm, of course the kid's going to say, yeah, I want to go on this fun adventure. Mm. So that's what I was like, ooh, this is very complicated. This mm -hmm. is very complicated. And and, and Dara verbalized that. So Yeah, no, and I think it is definitely sort of written is that it's definitely uh, in performed is that it's definitely in Dara's opinion that soul pushed too hard. Um but for me, I think I I I think about it from the perspective of Mother Anasea when she had the chance to have the heart to heart with Osha seems Mother Anasea does not detect any manipulation. Mother Anasea doesn't go, this isn't what you really want. You were talked into this. Mother Anasea seems to see like, it's heartbreaking, but my child wants a different choice. And I'll even fight my coven, not literally fight, but I'll disagree with my coven. Uh, her great line of, I choose mother. Um, all that for me, I think I, I just, uh, I, I, I think Saul made a lot of mistakes. And I think he absolutely was maybe pushing her too hard in that moment but I'm so affected by the fact that the show is going out of its way to get us to believe that OSHA's choice is pure. And maybe the adults involved got involved in the wrong way. And, you know, if the Jedi hadn't shown up, would Mother Ansea have just pushed her to say like, the ceremony's tonight, the moons are coming together now. <laughs> I know you're uncomfortable with this, but it's happening, kid. Uh, would Mother Ansea not have been able to take that step back have a conversation with her child and embrace what she is vocalizing as her child's agency without the Jedi intervention. Uh, and, and for me, this isn't even a like the Jedi were right. It's just for me wrestling with the complexity of the, these choices. And I think I'm also just kind of clinging like driftwood in the sea to anything that the show wants to make crystal clear. And to me, my interpretation, my opinion is that the show has been crystal clear of like, Osha did not want to ascend. She wanted to go and explore the galaxy and make a different choice. So I, I'm clinging to that <laughs> as you navigate the murky moral waters. I uh, agree with that. Awesome. Uh, Ken, um, I want to get into to the, this, the duality, uh, the, mm -hmm. the sign tapping. Is that good with you to go to next? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or did sure, you have sure. a thought Absolutely. you wanted to share on well, what we were just talking about? Well, some of the stuff uh, that uh, I see with 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 soul is, is this idea, especially in the opening scenes, there's this quest for nobility, this quest for something that's important. And he believes, you know, you got Torben going, you know, I want to go back home, which I have some suck it up kid kind of vibes from Gen X to, to him, but that's a different maybe show. Um, but he wants, to, what's the purpose here? And soul's got one, but he wants to, he wants something more. And I, and I think it's also a question of, of Jen, you mentioned balance, you yourself being unbalanced. So we, we talk about balance and we talk about it's unbalanced when the dark pushes uh, over the light unnaturally. There was moments, and I'm not saying this as, as my 100% interpretation or the, the answer. I'm just saying there was moments where I felt Saul was unbalanced and, and maybe unnaturally pushing the light. I won't say over the dark, but pushing it. Uh, with good intentions and with the information that he had, so he makes decisions kind of out of that. Like, no, this this is this is good. Trust me, it's what I want. It's what I feel. There's that destiny. He's he's leaning into destiny. This is an episode about choices, and I just felt some of his decisions were, were around that idea of just just um, unnaturally pushing things forward. So uh, then we can slide into what you're saying there. Yeah, no, and I definitely want to talk more about soul because I think that the I think that is one of the more more complicated and inter interesting things is it it raises lots of questions, lots of different characters' point of view of why exactly did soul make this choice? But I don't feel like I feel like the show leaves it up to our interpretation. So I, I want to dig even more into soul's choices. Uh, but I just wanted to touch uh, briefly on that whole idea of 
of duality that's been so present in the show. And I think it, cause I think it's one of the things that heightens this tragedy. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I agree with you that a lot of the characters are uh, paired and mirrored. Ken, I think mm -hmm. Sol and Chimere have been mirrored as the teachers of May and Osha and all that. But I also feel mm -hmm. like Sol and Mother Anasea are mirrored up to a point in this episode in that mm -hmm. the most crucial thing is Osha's choice. And this is a great tragedy of like, if Sol and Mother Anasea could have sat down and had a conversation without all of the escalations around them, they were aligned. They both want to give Osha her choice. Yep. They're both in defiance of their organizations because mm -hmm. the Coven doesn't want Mother Anasea to let Osha have her choice. The Jedi don't want uh, Sol to present a choice mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, to Osha. They both at different points try to de-escalate. So I think they're in in some ways to my mind they're kind of they're kind of paired. I think Torben and, and Coral are paired in this episode because as you go through and just sort of tick off, well, who did escalate when? Mm -hmm. Those are the escalators. Uh, mm -hmm. It it might be Soul's choices driving some of this, mm -hmm. but every time where it maybe could have just been a conversation, it, it, a lot of the times it's Torben and Coral, including you know, that the kind of last uh, near last horrific moment of, mm -hmm. of soul killing mother Anasea happens because both Torben and Coral escalate to, to violence. Right. Uh, so I thought uh, that was interesting. Uh, and then I think the mirroring thing became even more uh, powerful with this uh, revelation that the characters, uh, the Jedi believe that Osha and may are, are split of one being Um which I wanted to ask you both your opinion about. Uh, again, it's we, we have to trust our narrators because this is Jedi are sitting around talking. They see that they have the exact same midi chlorians uh, and say, "Well, only a virgins could do that. Could have the power to split one consciousness into two bodies that matches up with their poem. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, always one, but born as two. So." Jennifer, we talked a lot when we when we discussed chapter three about um, is one dark and is one light uh, or is it more complicated and nuanced than that? Do you think the Jedi are correct? Or that's what happened. The one one consciousness was split into two bodies. And if so, how do you feel about that? I feel vindicated. That was I feel like what I was saying. Yeah, uh, weeks ago, I'm like they are one split in two, uh, the same consciousness. So I was like, yes. Oh, I wish I had a pr predict predicting video, right? Because then I'd be like, <laughs> 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 and then I'd be right. Um, but yeah, I, it makes sense. It it makes sense, and I always love when there's a a midichlorian moment. It just mm. took me back <laughs> to the Phantom Menace. I was like, I really like this. Um, but yeah, mm. it, it makes sense as to why they're. It's not just like tin twin. Tele telekinesis or whatever they say, right? Mm -hmm. This this is a deeper, deeper bond. And I think it's going to make it more complicated in the next episode. It also explains why Soul maybe could not detect that that they had switched places mm. all of the parent trap. So, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Ken, how did you feel about that uh, revelation? A, do you, do you uh, take the Jedi's word for it, that that is the truth? And if so, how do you feel about it? I felt vindicated for, for Jen. I thought about that too, Jen. Uh, absolutely. I think um, it makes sense. I think the information is, uh, you know, science-based at this point. So now we'll <laughs> see what it means. Uh, you know, they got the stats and figures right in front of them here. But we, I, I feel as though we don't, you know, how, the how of it is, is not been explained. And I don't know if we'll ever get that. I don't think we're going to get a flashback to them in a laboratory cooking something up there and Mother Coral and NSA. I don't think we'll get that. I think I think it is deliciously uh, up for interpretation. Uh, but I, I, it made a lot of sense. And in a series that's uh, dealing with duality, to actually have um, one of the main characters be, be one of the same, uh, which is the two wolves inside of all of us, right? That uh, Dave Filoni would sketch on a on a napkin. We got those two wolves, and I, I think this uh, it's just a fun, simple, and and direct kind of concept to play with. Mm -hmm. I, I think for me that there, I, I think you're right. I don't think we're gonna. This last episode has a lot to cover. I don't think we're gonna a get lot. also a flashback of <laughs> a uh, lot. Yeah. Co cooking up the twins. Um, I, but mm -hmm. it's fun to think about. Mother Coral is so certain that the Jedi would be incredibly upset by it. It, it makes it sound like they did something. Yeah really awful but it's like 
would the Jedi be like, yeah, we wouldn't normally use a virgins to do that, but uh, yeah. yeah. Um, the, I think the thing that I really reacted to is I feel like the show, in my opinion, wants to have duality, but also say it's not as simple as that. And I could mm -hmm. see readings of this where like, oh, she, uh, she was one being split into two bodies and may got all the anger and the fear and the dark side and oh, she got all the light. And like, mm -hmm. I feel like what we've seen of the characters is even though they are two uh, or one consciousness split into two bodies, that both are capable of a range of emotions and both are capable of making the choices of an individual. We, we see Osha's Certainly. anger and fear and trauma about her past. We see uh, May's, you know, mercy shown to the child in the bar in the in the first scene. So I think mm -hmm. the only thing that made me uh, stop about that was I don't think the show is going to put it forward as simple as they're twins and May got the dark side energy and yeah. Osha got the light side energy, period. Maybe May got 60% energy, <laughs> uh, angry energy, mm -hmm. and is more quick to anger. And Osha got 60% calmer energy. Uh, but mm -hmm. I don't think it's as simple as light side, dark side. Yeah. No. And you still got to make the choices no matter what's inside, right? You are you're not defined by who you are. You're defined by those choices. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, final other thing I want to say about the sort of duality in, in mirroring is that uh, I felt this in part three, but I thought it was reinforced to hear again that the Jedi and the Coven might be doing different things, but they their spoken beliefs are relatively similar. Like, mm -hmm. we, we don't know exactly what the Ascension is. There's still some ambiguity there. But the way Mother Anasea talks about it kindly, facing your fear is a necessary part of growth, sacrificing a part of yourself, which I feel like she is saying, like, you, you as an individual have to give something of yourself to the larger community. And there's a ceremony the same way a youngling would have a Jedi trial. I think, again, it's a part of the tragedy uh, that maybe their beliefs really are not that different, particularly uh, if you could get, you know, at the escalators, Torben and Coral out of it and get Soul and Anasea and Inara, Indara talking. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, all right. So I, I want to talk about the overall theme of kind of choices and agency, because I think there's a lot of that. There's a ton to talk about with Soul. Uh, but I think there's a lot with going on with Torben. I think there's a lot going on with the way that Anasea uh, uh, works Torben. Uh, I think there's a lot going on with what Coral uh, chooses. So let's get into the big question of Saul. Uh, Jennifer, do you have an opinion of what is truly motivating Saul? Um, I'm sorry, I asked the question, but I want to share more thoughts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go <laughs> ahead. You yeah. I apologize. No, no. Um, I just wanted to throw this out, out kind of the evidence that I see in, in the show uh, at the very end of the episode, Indara asks him when she's trying to convince him to lie to the Jedi council, which he doesn't want to do and hide information from OSHA. Cause she's making the argument that the bigger picture of OSHA's well-being and holding onto a dream is worth it. But she says to him, ask yourself why you made this choice. So the episode even kind of ends with that question. Uh, there's it's put forth that soul is, projecting and Dara accuses him twice of projecting his own feelings onto Torben uh, because he's because soul is maybe too invested in the virgins and in the importance of the mission, like Ken was saying. Uh, Indara accuses him of projecting on Osha that it's not Osha who deeply wants to be a Jedi. It's soul who wants her to be one uh, uh, in Dara's quote saying, do not confuse what Osha wants with what you want. Um, then there's also just the so often we as fans want Jedi to be more intuitive and use their emotions. So is he truly sensing there is a profound connection between us and I'm listening to the will of the force and I'm being warm and kind to a child. And is soul right that the argument that he makes is like, I'm, I'm clear on this. I know she's in danger. I know this is best for her. I'm protecting her and giving her the life she wants. So I think there's all sorts of options for why Soul is making the choice presented by the episode. So with all that thrown out there, back to the question, again, my apologies. What is your take through all of that? What Soul is actually, what is making him make his choice? This is what makes it so murky. I do think he believes, as he said, they don't treat them like children. What is that about? 
I was like, why does he have, is it just that's what he believes that children should be treated a certain way because of what he's seen? Is it something from his own past that he's, mm -hmm. that he's responding to? I think he sees maybe some of himself in OSHA in some way. I think he can maybe sense that a little bit, but I also feel like we get at the beginning of the episode where he's like, she's, you know, and Dara makes that comment. That's why you don't have a Padawan. I think that maybe he wants to teach someone. He wants to be a mentor. He wants to pass on what he has learned to, to someone else. I, that's why I think it's really complicated. I think it is a little selfish, but I think he also is sensing something in her. Um, but that's why the whole, the whole scene where he's kind of like coaching her, it's like he knows that she wants it, but he wants it too. And he's kind of pushing a little bit more to kind of force that. Mm-hmm. I, I agree with that, but I am also affected by her, 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 uh, her coven did ask her to lie. <laughs> True. So, it, it, but so, so did Andara. Andara asked him to lie. Oh, so, right. Yeah, so no, it's like every, everyone's at, asking for lies back and forth for sure. Yes. <laughs> right. Right. And the reason why they did that is because they believe that she should stay with the family. And so I'm like, well, okay. That's an okay lie. <laughs> I accept that lie. Uh, yeah. You know, uh, but yeah, no, uh, because they don't trust that she really knows what she wants at that age. Right. I, that's kind of how I also took it as well. Right. Right. And that's such a fascinating thing because it is such an important and complicated real world choice of what age should a child make a choice. But mm -hmm. it feels like the show is trying to be like, that's not the question we're asking. Because the show is framed, that, that's why I'm so obsessed with the show seems to be framing that OSHA wants this choice. She doesn't want the Ascension. She wants something different. Maybe she's being pushed into making the Jedi choice because it's the only option behind door B. But the show seems so focused on making it clear that this is the choice that she wants. So for me, I, I, I find it, it, it it's... It's so tempting to go into the real world rabbit holes that I'm trying to, for myself, stay focused on what did the sh what's in the show, because the real you know, world question of what yes. age is appropriate for a child, like that's be complicated, sensitive beyond me, and also I feel like for myself, not what the show is asking. I think you're right, and I think part of the issue for me is that I'm viewing like like when I think of the movies that we grew up with in the '80s, right. It, it, that was about the kid venturing off onto an adventure, a journey, this hero's journey. And that just was kind of like part of our culture that we would see. And now over time and research, <laughs> that is <the laughs> understanding about, you know, the prefrontal cortex or whatever, the frontal lobe and all these things that we know about children and when they develop and what, what age they actually are able to make decisions. I feel like and also me being a parent now, I'm mm -hmm. like, she's too young. She doesn't know <laughs> that she wants to be a fairy. You know, like, how can how can she make that choice for herself right now? You know, she may want to be a doctor someday. So uh, I think I have to go back to that, like, kind of, like, nostalgic, uh, uh, the put on my nostalgic glasses of when I would watch these kids, these movies when I was growing up. And a kid myself and being like, yes go off on that big adventure, go and join the Jedi. Right. And I think you're right. I think that that's what the show is asking us to do. Not, I have to turn off the parent side of me. It's like, please stay with your family. Don't go off and grow <laughs> up and be a Jedi. <laughs> no, I, I totally understand. Cause I think it, it is so tempting to do that. And, and I'm trying to keep my analysis to like, what did the, cause I almost said a thing and like, don't say that. Cause that's not what the show is asking about. You know, mm -hmm, it's getting into, mm -hmm too too far into into real world questions but i i totally agree with you i think it's this is a fantasy so just like we agree that a tie fighter doesn't make that cool noise in space but it does in this show <laughs> whether or not it's true in the real world we're agreeing that kids can make this choice because that's <laughs> right that's what so coded with osha did make this choice anyway yes. I'll, I'll let that yes. go ken what is uh, what is your take on what is truly motivating soul? Do you feel like the show has an answer? Do you feel like it's being left up to I, us? Go anywhere I, I, you want. Yeah, I, I go back to even what I was saying, that there's a little bit of an unbalance in soul because he wants something so much. And you, Jen, you highlighted one of my like 
I put that as a WTF moment in a fun way of, of Vindara being like, ah, that's why you don't have a pedal on, loser. <laughs> and he's, <laughs> I love his reaction. <laughs> um, but this is something that's known. He wants it too much. And what he wants isn't necessarily a bad thing. I go to Qui-Gon. There's been a lot of connections between uh, uh, Soul and, uh, and Qui-Gon. Qui-Gon, upon finding what he be believed to be a, a virgin in the Force, uh, does, you know, and I know people will talk about the chance cu cube moment and all that stuff, but he kind of leaves a lot of it up to just the natural flow of things, and we'll see what emerges. Uh, I, I think just on the simply putting a nine-year-old in a pod race where people die <laughs> and just kind of sitting back and watching and see what plays out here, I think Qui-Gon's got a want something, but he's going to see what emerges. Mother Anasea in her dude moment is you killed me and you were going to win. Like I was going to give you what you wanted. This is what Osha wanted and you had it. And, and, and I think if Saul had just hung back, this, the theme of the whole episode is just hang back. Everybody calm down. This is, this is, this is FUBAR. This is a foobar situation that you're all just making it more and more complicated. And 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 and, and I and I actually love that. It's one of the things I loved about the episode is um, there, there's a bunch of good intentions. There's a bunch of rights. There's a lot of wrongs. And then the, the wrongs, you know, just compound everything. But I think going to the specific mo that moment where she's like, dude, you just killed me. I, I was go you you won. I, I got for the better of her. I was going to let her go. And now this, she, almost as if she knows you've you've gone done messed up, because my wife ain't gonna be happy. <laughs> this is not gonna go good. And even though in the end Saul gets seems to get what he wants, he has Osha as a Padawan. And I talk about that in Dara moment. I love that. Like, oh, now you're gonna now you're gonna leave her. Now you're gonna be all rules and high and mighty and see and hurt her even more. You did this. This is what you wanted. Now you, this is where you go from here, Saul. Uh, I think that, but that comes later. I think, but he. But that, that's also my point. He gets what he, he wants, but he forced it unnaturally. And now it has lasting ramifications. 16 years later, we are seeing this come back and leading directly, I think, to the fall of the Jedi because you damn well know that once this all comes out, now the Jedi are going to be put under a consent decree. They're going to be uh, checked. They're going to be balanced. And they're going to be tools of the Republic in a way they've never been before. Uh, and it, and not, not saying the entire Fall of Jedi goes down to this episode or this story. I'm just saying it's part of the symptoms uh, that are, are being uh, um, exposed right now or being felt in the Jedi Order. And it all comes down to, Saul, you just had sat back and mm. see what emerges. Not push yeah. push what you want over everything else. Mm, I think he did. I think he did push what he wanted o over everything else. But I think for myself, it's more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. Soul was correct that that Osha was in some level of of danger mm -hmm. uh, because Coral in the rest of the Coven were not going to want to let her go. Was was the mother going to win, or was there going to be conflict? If Sol had gone there by himself, because it, it, it's a huge part of the, of the of the show, and we'll get to Torben. Torben's the one who who gets hot headed. Uh, yeah. Sol is Sol is there having a, a heated discussion with Dara about what should be done next. Torben jumps on that ship for for his own mm -hmm. reasons or on that speeder. Yeah. Sol yep. and Mother Anasea are talking. Mother Anasea gets the 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 shot off that we 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 can talk about of your noble intentions are going to get all the Jedi in the galaxy killed, right. but what escalates things is there's you know the noise and both Torben and Coral go into their battle stances, yeah, and and that's where all where everything falls apart. So I do think there's a world where if Sol had been able to go in there alone, perhaps he and Mother Anasea would have been able to get on the the same page. So Sol has a ton of culpability in, in all these yeah. things. He's the motivating factor in all this. But I also think it is more complicated than than entirely uh, on Sol because of yeah. all of these different players and all of their different needs and all of their different moments of escalation, which is why it brings me back to sort of like Romeo and Juliet of people keep trying but then this person says this thing and this person stabs this person and then this and this and this, you know? I, I, you, could, you could plot it on a chart. I think you're very right because you, you – and this is not to put blame on anyone. But if you chart it and Dara has the right thought, the four of us shouldn't go. That's that's an act of, 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 of war. It's an act of aggression that's going to be received as such. She understands it. 
Because, by the way, in, after episode three, that's what everyone in the Star Wars fandom took it as. The Jedi, look at these damn Jedi showing up all aggressive. She had the right idea. She she backs off on it, listens to, the, all right, team, fine, we'll go into the team. And I don't even think that's the wrong decision. But that leads to this, this, this. And, and you're right, even Torben, you know, if, if Saul had said, all right, you're here, stay down here. I got to go do this, to your point. I got to go do mm -hmm. this. Torben, yeah, 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 okay, I'm going to climb with you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are a million moments like that. I mean, and yeah. Sol asks, yeah. so Sol asks Torben to come with him and says, I need your help to get the girls safe. So anyway. Right, um, yeah, but but that's my point. It's like, and it just, and it's and it's fun to track, but it's like each one has a, it's a sliding scale of, of yeah. decisions. Yeah, I think for me with, with Sol's uh, decision, I think the little breadcrumbs we've got about his past, his speech about feeling kind of alone and ostracized in his uh, community of origin and then feeling so warm and, and welcomed and safe when the Jedi took him in and there were other right. children like him. Uh, the detail that Vernestra shares in the first episode, like you were so shy. Uh, the fact that we meet him uh, teaching younglings, I think he, he is a very sensitive, caring soul, uh, no pun intended, uh, who, who had some trauma as a kid and I think he is projecting um, that his trauma when, when he says uh, they do not treat the girls like children. I think it's for him. It's it's a it's a trigger of he's really watching out for children in trauma. And I think this is also a part of the, you know, uh, from a certain point of view, tragedy. We saw in episode three, the witch's perspective, and we saw Mother Anasea being, in my opinion, a a good mother. We saw, you know, a healthy community with fun snacks. <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. And we understand that what he saw was part of a training exercise in a moment of conflict. But the only thing he sees mm -hmm. is children being taught combat. And when they do it wrong, they're pushed to the ground. Mm -hmm. So I also do want to give him credit for he saw he did see some things that would make him oh, think yeah. Chil these children might be in danger and we at least need to check on it mm -hmm. to see if they're in danger. So I think he, in my opinion, I think he took something legitimate of mm -hmm. a, a true misunderstanding of he didn't see the truth that this is a, a complex uh, uh, community and society. He just saw uh, two girls being trained in, in combat and pushed to the ground. Yep. But how is and that? And then he also put his own uh, emotions, I think, into it of this is my highest calling as a Jedi is to protect young ones. And yeah, I think he is putting his own childhood trauma in it. I'm sorry, Jennifer, what were you saying? No, but that's why I was so frustrated is I'm like, you are wrong. You are wrong. How is this any different when they're training these children to defend themselves? And really any different from what the Jedi are doing to train these children to later on go in combat. I mean, look at poor Jackie. She was, the, you know, you brought this kid here and that's the sacrifice that she paid. And that's why I'm like, Oh, Saul, please stop looking at it through this lens of, of what you deem is a good community. What you deem as, a, as a, a, an acceptable society for a child to be raised in. Those children were loved. Those children were protected. And, and you are taking young leans and training them as well. So I just, I, that's where I was like, oh, this is, this is what you're saying, Ken, where he's like, He's going so far to the light, like the light is tipping out the dark, but that is not good as well. He's believing that he's going to be the the hero and rescue the child, but he's, in my opinion, he's wrong. And we don't know that the children would have been in danger. We don't know that. Who knows what Mother Anasea would have done or how they would have reacted, mm -hmm. potentially. But that that's why this is such a tragedy is because mm -hmm. we won't ever know what events could have occurred if everyone had just been calm <laughs> and, and just, you know, had a, had a reasonable conversation about this. Yeah. If that uh, <laughs> fortress had had a doorbell, I there think you everything go. would have been Jeez. fine because there I think Soul was right. fine. I think from what Soul saw and from mm -hmm. his compassionate heart, yeah. uh, I think that there's nothing wrong with ringing the doorbell and saying, How, who, who are you? How are you? What do you, you know, we're here. We're the Jedi, you know, what are you doing on this planet? What's going on with you? Can we have a conversation? Like that would have been great. I feel like the, I agree with you. I think this is what the tragedy is. I think we, the audience now have the benefit of seeing most of what's going on with the witches. We actually don't know what the Ascension is. Like right. mm -hmm. we actually, and 
and so the children will lead. Does that mean in, you know, 70 years when all of these witches pass away, they'll take the coven? Or is it like, no, in about two months when the moon's aligned again, we're going to possess your body? Like, don't know what mm -hmm. the ascension is. So just for myself, mm -hmm. put that to, to the side. Um, th this is why I'm saying I think the um, witches and the Jedi are aligned they are very similar in training their padawans but that's but but soul doesn't see the entire picture he only sees a part of it it's like if a witch just saw there's a great moment in the first high republic book where a, a jedi master with a great relationship with his padawan they love each other he he can't figure out how to uh, float to the ground when falling so he just pushes him off the cliff so he can mm -hmm. figure it out in the moment and it's portrayed in the book as this like fun pushing your kid on the bike and you just, you know, you gotta, you gotta figure it out. And I'm there for you if you fall kind of thing. And if like a witch came in and just saw a Jedi master <laughs> use the force to shove their child off a cliff, yeah. they'd be like, we need to intervene. Right. Uh, and mm -hmm. I feel like that's mm -hmm. part of the tragedy of him only seeing part of it. Yeah. And Dara says, we do not have all the information that comes out a, a lot. And, and, and Sola, I, I think has good intentions all around, but he uses the words fear and fears and wonders a lot. I, I wrote down a couple of those moments, not a lot, but there's a couple sentences that he says, a couple lines of dialogue where he's like, I fear and I wonder versus I have a concern and I'd like to find out. Right. It, it's and, and, and we all we all do that. We all do mm -hmm. that in those situations. And I do think it is part of their mandate to say, hey, is someone in trouble here? This doesn't seem right. Um, that's not a bad starting point for me at all. Yeah. Yeah. I think Torben it, with you. <laughs> yeah. I think this gets into some of the stuff that I wanted to be sure to talk about with the Jedi as a, as a whole mm -hmm. is that, uh, I think to me, what's complex about the, the, this episode is, uh, I think soul was projecting. I think he was pushing too hard. I think he did escalate things. I'm not here to just like apologize for soul. I think he made a lot of mistakes, including the absolute horror of killing mother Anasea. Um, but, I think th in terms of looking at the Jedi, um, Soul has, uh, you know, he doesn't have the complete information, uh, but he's got this great quote of like, well, if the council, if we have to wait for the council or the council is going to say no, then who is protecting this child if not the Jedi? I think we're all reacting emotionally because we have more information than, than Saul did mm -hmm. that maybe the child wasn't in danger. But what if the child was? And, and I think the thing what I'm reacting to in the kind of the big picture discussion of the Jedi is that the, the Jedi are making a choice to say we have power and we're not just going to sit and meditate. We're going to use that power. We have appointed ourselves to be the guardians of peace and justice. By definition, they have to intervene from time to time. And then the question becomes, well, when do they intervene in what situation, which I think what we're, we're all analyzing of who is right to intervene in what. But in the larger picture of the Jedi, I think um, we've had so much storytelling where the audience, the fandom pumps their fist for Jedi who say the council is wrong to not intervene and we're going to take it upon ourselves to intervene. It is the entire debate of The Last Jedi that Luke's like, well, if I do anything, it might make matters worse, so I'll hide on an island. And by the end, he's convinced, no, the, he needs to allow, allow himself to be seen as a hero. He needs to intervene. Uh, many fans get upset and point at it as a failure of the Jedi that Qui-Gon goes to Tatooine and doesn't just free slaves right and left, but says, I can't intervene. It's not my thing to intervene. When Ahsoka leaves the Jedi Order in the Clone Wars, and when we get the, the follow-up episodes with her kind of deciding her path, she comes to this conclusion that, well, a Jedi's job is to wander the galaxy, and when they see a people in trouble in asking for help, which might be the key there of asking for help, uh, they have to intervene. So I feel like we've had a lot of storytelling that, that asks us to kind of um, be upset with the Jedi when they refuse to intervene. And then this is, a, interestingly, a story where I feel like uh, uh, there is a push toward the Jedi are right to say, don't intervene. And for me, it's interesting because I think that's the huge question of the Jedi is in, in, in the, the noble path, the noble intentions. 
and to bring it to real world things, imagine you had that power and you had to choose constantly. Do I intervene? I'm not sure exactly what's going on in that house, but I do think a child might be in danger. Do I use my power or not? I just wanted to kind of raise that as a, as a larger question of the Jedi, because we always get the benefit of the story, but the Jedi don't always have the benefit of the whole story. And it is a part of what the Jedi are to, to say, yes, we're going to intervene. That's in our mandate because we're using our power and that those things are a, a difficult, complicated choice. Uh, Ken, how do you feel about just sort of the big picture of when the Jedi intervene and when they don't? Because it, it can't always be the heroic answer to not intervene, can it? Yeah, it absolutely it can't be. Uh, why would you? Like, um, you know, you see something on the street. How many of us think, should I get involved? Or should I not? It's just just something that I should turn my back to, or should I go see if it's okay? Uh, and 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 that happens a lot. And 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 I've been in those situations. And let me tell you, they're they're really tough. They're really tough, and it can backfire real fast, and it can uh, spin out of control real fast. But I still think that's part of the reason they're here, the Jedi, the Jedi Order. Um, that's why I like this. You talk about fist pumping. There was a fist pumping of for me of just like, nah, we're not to. You know, we've gone too far. We've we've messed up the balance. But Saul has some actual legit concerns again, without all the information. Uh, and let's find out. I, I'm going to always give them the benefit of the doubt to go find out. I'm always going to give them the benefit of that uh, doubt. Um, we're talking a lot about his personal wants, desires, his quest for nobility. Um, then we got the mother and a sale line we can break down in themes or canon or favorite moments because it's all of them. <laughs> uh, but um, I'm not going to fault them for because I, I believe their intentions are always a good starting point. I, I don't fault them mm -hmm. for that at all. And, and, and I think for me, from to make it clear to anyone watching and listening, like I'm not, I don't fault anyone here uh, other than just as just an, an analysis of a tragedy. <laughs> this is mm -hmm. what this is, and it's breaking it down in a mythic way. Uh, on, on you know that's why that that chart I'm talking about of this decision, this decision, mm -hmm. it's all very natural. Um, and I do want to, but I do want to acknowledge. I think a lot of Saul's actions and Indar's and all of them. I think they, they start from a good spot. Torben, we can dig into. Uh, I, I think there's, you know, a lot, a lot going on with him, but yeah, you know, yeah, different. absolutely. Uh, Jen, do you have any big picture thoughts about when the Jedi intervene and when they don't? And then we can talk Torben. Uh, yeah, I think that if the Jedi want to be child protective services, that's fine. <laughs> However, as we know in our real life, when you go and you talk with people, you can't just like rip kids away based on a hunch based mm -hmm. on a feeling that, or maybe based on the fact that you don't like how they're parenting their kid. That's just not the way we work. And there are times where, you know, abuse is a, is a, is a tricky thing. And sometimes it might be verbal abuse and like you, you may not know it and they may be a wealthy family and they have all this other stuff on the outside. Everything's perfect. Right. But the kid knows that this is not right. And the kid is being told to not say anything, right? And so that's where it becomes, uh, this is the agency. This is this is the world that we live in, right? That's why Qui-Gon, I mean, he sees that this Anakin is enslaved. He doesn't just go and say, come with me, kid. We're taking you away from this place. Like, he has to let things play out because that is his that is like kind of like the the you know societal uh, gal galactic agreement that they have you can't just go and intervene every time you think something is wrong even though you know in that instance with anakin that is wrong Watto should not should not uh be in charge of that kid <laughs> um <laughs> Watto ain't great dad material i don't think that's controversial he's not a, he's not a great dad so yeah. you know i i i it's complicated i do think that yeah the jedi should investigate but they have to be careful with if they're going to be ripping kids away from their families. And yeah. what is the evidence behind that? You know? Yeah. And for myself to be very clear, like I think Saul makes mistakes. And I, th I think it's understandable to, to, to me that he would want to look into the situation. Yeah. I think he looked into it. I don't think they found the right way to look into it. And they have all those moments of tragedy. Maybe if Indara had gone in alone and did Ben really like hands up being like, just, just want to talk you know, out, and yeah. not provoke. I think for me, what I was wrestling with is um, ju just, I always want to look at the Jedi as a, is a bigger picture. Cause I think it's easy to be sort of at home, uh, you know, armchair quarterback, because we get to full see the full story that, uh, that to me, the story of the Jedi is 
sometimes intervention is correct and other times it's not. And the entire challenge of their noble path is figuring out when to intervene. And this is to me is an episode of tragedy about maybe they should have intervened. Maybe they shouldn't have, but they definitely escalated things by the way they chose to intervene for myself. Mm -hmm. There, there was a conversation I had uh, this past weekend. Uh, nice a gentleman I ran into, and we were just talking about Star Wars because I made the mistake of wearing a Star Wars hat in public. And uh, <laughs> he uh, he had some issues with the prequels, which is uh, fair. But he just said, you know, for me, the Jedi were established as badasses, and then they lost in a couple seconds. And I thought, and yeah, it's one fair way to look at it. But I, I would argue that, and I didn't because uh, I was getting pizza. Uh, <laughs> I would argue oh, no. that. Uh, no, the Jedi aren't badasses. The Jedi could mm. be badasses, mm -hmm. but they're trained not to be. They're mm -hmm. trained when is the right time to be that badass. Mm -hmm. uh, Soul pulls back, jumping uh, jumping around a bit and looking at something mm -hmm. specific. He jumps back when Mother Coral's like, cool, I'm going to fight you. And he's like, saber her away. Saber her away because mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not here to kill her. Um, and then she says, what I think's a clue, <laughs> uh, <laughs> fight me. Seems to be some kind of I don't know where I've heard that before in the series and who said that and who has those thoughts. Um and we don't see her body and she flitters away. Um but you know what I mean? Like uh Yeah. I don't know. I lost the train of thought other than I want pizza now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, who among us doesn't? Let's talk uh let's talk uh Torben and, and Coral. Uh I love that scene uh with with Torben. And I think we've also been wondering about Saul waiting to have our hearts broken because I think he is coded as a as a caring and uh, often very de-escalate pacifistic person. And we've all been waiting to get our hearts broken to see, you know, where, where he screwed up. But let's not take our focus off Torben. Let's not let just let Torben slide. <laughs> uh, because uh, there's a lot going on with agency and choice that Mother Anasea, obviously a fair argument that the Jedi came in here and she's taking over his mind as a way of defense. Uh, but what she's doing is this, you know, seduction of it, it's coded like the dark side cave the dark side cave whispers mm -hmm. to you you want something and if you say yes dark side cave give it to me then you're giving up your control and that's what she does she asks in this nice way of like don't you want to leave don't you want to leave don't you want to you know let go of the uh the bigger commitment to the larger uh order and just focus on your own selfish needs torben and then when he says yes she's able to take over his mind uh so I feel like he escalates things a lot because he just really does not want to be on that planet uh, initially as a pouty teenager. And then I think after or 25 year old, I have no idea how old, how old he is. Um, and then once I think he has the fear installed in him by having had his mind and his body taken over, I think he's afraid and he just he wants to get out of there. And when he jumps on the speeder, which is one of the key escalation moments, uh, he shouts, we just need proof of a virgence, and those girls are the proof, and then we can go home. So, Jennifer, how do you feel like kind of Torben's r role? Uh, you know, poor youngster caught up in it, uh, mind invaded, convinced to give in to his own wants and needs, escalates things out of fear and a desire to go home. Where do you go with Torben? I wonder really what. Is it just that he wants to go home? Is it that he really realizes this is not what I signed up for or, you know, like uh, being on this planet? N you know, I, I don't really know. Like, it's got to be a deeper desire than just like, I want to go home, right? I mean, maybe <laughs> he could be. Uh, the desire is strong when your kids are like, I don't want to be here. So <laughs> but there was a moment with Mother Anasea that I thought was really fascinating was, yes, there was like this seduction kind of happening. It was sexual. And then there was a flash of ma a maternal look that she gave him. I think it was when she said, like, I can give you what you need or something like that, where I was thought she was going to like really go in for this like, you know, sed seduction. And instead it was like flipped to almost like a maternal energy. And I was like, ooh, that's an interesting thing to, to play. And that I think was what led him to kind of kneel is that she was this all encompassing thing that he needed, not just like desires, but also comfort, right? Mm. That, that maternal comfort maybe that he was seeking and just like, he just gave in. Um, yeah, I thought that that was really, really interesting. And I don't know how I feel about Torbim. It explains why he uh, took the poison. Because I was like, why did he do it? What did he do that was so bad? I think that he he lost his honor. 
in that moment. Like, you know what I mean? That's how I'm mm -hmm. justifying it. But otherwise, I don't know. Maybe there's something deeper that I'm missing. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree with you about uh, that that scene. I think she there's lots of different kinds of elements of comfort, desire, you know, whatever. Uh, but I think there is a direct uh, motherly thing. Just like your master won't let you pursue what you need. I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. But yeah. I would. Yeah, it's, right. It's That's a total right. like, mm -hmm. come live with this parent. He'll let you have pizza every night <laughs> kind of mm -hmm. seduction. But I, I can't ignore mm -hmm. in analyzing everything. W she's promising all this comfort. I'll be I'll be a better mother. In the second he goes, yeah, there's a flip to Neil. Mm -hmm. And she's doing all this to take control of him, to take his agency. And and uh, for me, it's one of the great complex points because like, OK, great. The Jedi are intruding. She's trying to defend uh, her family and her children. But she is also doing it by taking a character's agency away. Uh, this is some of those details I love that just kind of make it totally complex and nuanced and all these characters behaving like multifaceted uh, people who make you know, good, bad and great choices. Uh, Ken, what are your thoughts on Torben? Uh, they're wonderfully complicated. I, I agree with you, Jen, even though I poked at him earlier. He's he's like a Gen Z or asking Friday off uh, for work-life balance when we need you in the office. Sorry, you're here. This is your job. You signed up for it. Uh, and I want to go home to Corson. Oh, do you want to go home Corson? Like, I I had that energy. Sorry. I had yeah. Baggage from, yeah. Baggage from last job. Oh, is it, is it your birthday? Okay. Um <laughs> and I, I do think it's a little bit more than that. And I, and I, and I do think it has to do with fear. I do, I do think it has to, he's bored. Let's not forget he's bored. I think, I think Saul's a little, Saul's a little bored too, but he has a bigger picture and quest for, uh, you know, something noble. I, I think of, of, of Yoda's words, uh, as a lot of people did in this episode, you know, venture excitement, a Jedi craves, not these things. Sure. But also never his mind on where he was, what he was doing. I think Torben has lost focus of that because he does feel trapped here. And that's what she says. Uh, she says, you're trapped here. Uh, you have good and natural talents that you're suppressing. I would always let you uh, have what you want and always uh, what yeah. you need. You know, you're going to get it here. Uh, it's a Turkish delight candy. Isn't that good? Don't you like that? <laughs> Don't you like that? that? And I said earlier on, and this is, and, and, and by the way, Jody Turner Smith, again, uh, probably Fabulous. one of my favorite performances in Star Wars recently. I think, yeah. I think there's each of these shows has a tone that doesn't always translate to other things. Sometimes, you know, obviously Andor looks, feels, looks different than other shows, but I think you could pluck her and put that character in any Star Wars story, she'd fit right in. She's doing such a great job. And so mm -hmm. it is, um, again, I'll say it, deliciously confusing. Uh, of he, she's, selling, she's selling to him the opposite of what she's sold to, to May and Osha in, 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 the, in the coven. Of, of, no, for the greater good, sacrifice a little bit of your wants and desires, right? And she knows the flip side of that is to, to come into his mind and be like, I just give in to every desire you have. Yeah, yeah. She should be quoting Yoda. Also, Yoda's other favorite quote: "What go on?" She, she's asking him <laughs> that too here. Four center favorite, I guess. Um, you know, I, I, it was that's why it was one of my favorite scenes because you could you whatever the motivating factor. And I'm with you, Jen. I I, I want to go back and trace a little bit more. Definitely want to hear what you have to say here, Joseph, because I do think he escalates, and I don't think he escalates out of good cause. Or I want to be a hero, or I, I'm just bored. I think there's there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of feeling trapped. A lot of feeling of uncertainty of who he is uh and it, and she uh absolutely exploits that yeah i think i think he's a fascinating fascinating escalation because i think he does just start with you know <laughs> this is boring i'm just mm -hmm. analyzing mm -hmm. plants just absolutely yeah, just that you know energy uh and then it becomes a conversation of because what he's he whines about besides kalnaka's cooking is uh wanting it to be big and noble and i think that ties into some of the the, the episodes themes about you know noble intentions and, and grand things and i think that's another motivation of saul saul seems like in awe of the virgins and you know mm -hmm. is some of his projecting on osha that she is a product of the virgins and soul kind of wanted to be involved you know he says a virgins that nothing could be more important to the jedi than a virgins so I think that that's another thing going on with Saul, but it seems like um, Torben's motivation escalates uh, 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 from just from from being bored to being wanting to be a part of something bigger, like it, it, and almost like just like this isn't 
uh, it's not even just like action adventure wanting the comfort of home, but like I want to be a, a it, it's not good enough to be in the talent show. S sign me to CAA, mom. Like he wants to be a <laughs> big deal, you know, uh, is an element of it. But then I think once you make once all of the choices start falling apart, it is Mother Anasea's understandable choice to take his mind fills him with absolute fear and terror. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Mother Anasea is a complicated character, fabulous performance. But to me, what she's doing is undeniably the dark side. Like it's 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 not she's not the same as Palpatine by any means. But it, the argument in the manipulation is the same of you have something you want. If you give in, I will give it to you. I didn't actually intend to give you that. I just needed control over you. It, yeah. It's to me what's happening. And then I think that that boy is just flooded with fear and he will do mm -hmm. anything to get off that planet. And he's a, I, he's got that great line about, you know, there's, there's something not right about those women. <laughs> I wrote it down uh, below, but it's, just, it's really panicky, right? Of like those witches are going to yeah. get me. It, he's so fear motivated, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, absolutely. Panic. Panic is a good way to describe him too. Panic, panic. Yeah. Um, one other thing I just wanted to talk about in, in general that, that we've been floating around is th this episode just floats back and forth between various agency taking. There's the whole large question of his soul pushing OSHA too much. Um, and, but but then there's kind of endless agency taking. NSA uh, controls Torben. The Jedi breaking in is, you know, using their agency to in invade the coven's home, uh, the entire coven taking over Kalnaka, um, the entire coven taking away Anasea's agency, because as the leader, she says, don't fight, de-escalate with the Jedi, do not fight them, and I want to let Osha go. So that's a, a, a little bit of a, you know, revolt and taking of agency. Um, I think I Indara is arguably, you know, taking away Osha's agency, it's well-intentioned, but by saying, don't tell her the truth and don't tell the council the truth, Indara is making that choice to take away Osha's agency of having full information. So I just kind of feel like there's a, a ton of different people making choices that make decisions for other people. Ken, how do you feel about that as kind of a, a theme or a, a way to analyze all of the, the murky morality? It's a good way to look at it. It's, it's about fear and control, even. And no one comes out of these episodes clean, right? And, and I think uh, that's okay. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we do have to, at the end, make our own choices. I think life's the gray area. I don't think we are all the time. I think we get lost in it. We get we drown in that grayness. Um, but you're seeing a lot of people do just that. I agree with you. At the end, uh, you know, Soul's ready to be like, yeah, you're right. Um and she says no, and I. But I agree uh, to a point with her reasoning, right? Like mm -hmm. you, you did all this, and now you're, now you're going to do that to her. Like no, no, we can figure it out. But I, I think that in the end proves to be partially, at least, a wrong decision. So I'm fascinated by it in terms of analyzing. Um, but I, again, I think a lot of folks can get lost in it, um, and no one comes out clean. But that doesn't mean um, the answer is everyone or every institution here uh, remains unclean and needs to go away. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, how do you feel about the the kind of cycle of agency taking? Yeah, the the moment with Indara really s s struck me because she's he has just been kind of selfish in some ways. Yes, he thinks that he's what he you know what he's doing is right, but then it's like now he wants to do what's right at the you know basically damaging osha further she's already been through so much and now because you want to do the honorable thing now you're gonna oh man i just was like yes thank you indara this this is he has he has been led by his own emotions and osha has kind of been like floating around and yes she wanted to be a part of of the jedi but um i think that indara was right to not mm -hmm. traumatize her further I mean, goodness gracious. Um, so that's what I think what makes this whole thing so complicated is I can understand what everyone's point of view. And I'm like, yeah, mm -hmm. don't don't tell them. Yeah, d lie. <laughs> yeah, it goes to that theme of sacrifice a part of yourself for the greater good from Indara's right. perspective. But yes. then also, I also see the other side of a lot of what is happening is because Saul wasn't honest with Osha. Like mm -hmm. perhaps May would have fallen in with Chimere and May would have been legitimately angry about the trauma she went through. But if Saul had said, 
I need to tell you the whole truth so you can make your choice whether you really want to be here or not. You know, would the situation that's happening now, and we'll see in the final episode how much it's coded as, mm-hmm. uh, is Soul at some point should have given Osha the truth and allowed her to make her choices based on the truth. Because she's going to get it now, and is it going to be worse that she that it was kept from her? But the truth mm-hmm. is that he chose her over her sister. That's the truth. He could, I mean, I don't know if he could have saved it, right? He might have lost both of them. But that moment I went, oh, he really effed up. You know what I mean? Like He's that's clearly haunted by it. Obviously. So, is, so it's like, well, are you going to tell her a half truth that all this stuff happened? I'm just not going to tell you that I chose you and basically killed your sister. Like, or is he going to tell her? Yes. And I chose you and therefore your sister died. I couldn't save her. You know what I mean? Like, then is she going to want to go with him and the Jedi? I know I wouldn't. I'd be, I'd be a little upset. So I feel like that's what makes it so complicated because that is the full truth. And Mm -hmm. if he doesn't share all of it, which obviously he's going to share it now. And now she's at an age where I think she can maybe deal with it more. I don't think that she could have handled the full truth in Mm -hmm. that moment. This is the, what I love about this also is the whole star Wars poetry. This is the classic Obi-Wan should have, you know, uh, Luke's like, I just thought I was uh, picking up my droids. Like, by the way, your father's a mass murderer. (laughs) Right. right, right. I I tried to save him, but he ended up with his legs and, and, on mm-hmm. the shore of a lava river. Sorry, dude. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, and a lot of people advocate for that and think Obi Wan was wrong and should have told Luke the whole truth right there. Uh, <sighs> and you know, it, it it's I I love how uh, how complicated it is mm-hmm. for sure. Um, uh, I I made um a list of just all of the moments of. Uh, <laughs> broken communication or lying eyes. Cause I thought it was fascinating, not only because it happened to the characters, but uh, a, a part of the intrigue of these shows is how much it happened to us. Um, the based on chapter three, episode three, uh, the audience was led to believe that Indara was kind of the hard ass. Uh, that's certainly what, what we talked about and several other people did. So I thought it was fascinating that we were only shown this little part of Indara. And now we understand all the choices she made that made her appear in episode three, like a hard ass. But in this episode, she's appears to be, you know, cautious, wise, a- empathetic to me. I really like that. Uh, focused on de-escalating all that. Um, I feel like uh, Saul's horrible choice to stab Anasia is, uh, is a total misunderstanding because when May runs out, he says, Osha, he thinks it's Osha. Then Torben and, and Coral face off, Violence is about to happen. And my reading of the scene is Mother Anasea is turning into mist. May starts turning into mist. I think she's just teleporting May out of there for safety. But because Sol believed his eyes and got the wrong twin, he interpreted that as an attack on an endangerment of Osha. So that's a total just it goes back to the theme of, you know, your eyes can deceive you. Um a, a, a big one that we've mentioned, which I think is fascinating, is uh, May misreporting what the Ascension is. Uh, we get we get the actual quote from Mother Anasea that uh, Ascension is about walking through fear. It is about sacrificing a part of yourself. <laughs> and then the way she uh, uh, answers the question from Indara is everyone must be sacrificed to fulfill their destiny. It's a pretty, pretty bad telephone game. Uh, Jennifer, how did you feel about that one, about uh, how how big of a deal that was, if it informed uh, Indara's choices? If that, it, the, what the Ascension actually is, informed Indara's choices? Because Indara, Indara really had a, let's listen to the council, let's not get involved. But then even she was concerned when May said, uh, mm-hmm. Ascension is sacrificing everyone, misreporting what Mother Anasea actually told her it is. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I wrote down that, uh, this was before that, where Indara says ceremonial markings are customary in other galaxies. I think that she's very, she's like a cultural diversity professor that I have, <laughs> where she really is aware of other customs, other cultures, and she's really trying to be understanding. And she's trying to help Saul be like, look, there's just different people who have different ways of expressing um, their culture. 
Uh, in that moment, yeah, I don't know. It was not one that I had really clocked. Um, I'd have mm -hmm. to go back and analyze it. But I think overall, yeah, she is very empathetic to May. She is very empathetic to being sensitive, to being respectful of the witches and their community and their culture. And I think she, everyone around her is not. And she's like trying to be like, you guys, calm down. It's okay. It's okay that they have markings on their face. It's all right, everyone. Let's not get up in arms over this, right? Mm -hmm. um, whereas Saul just seems to be hell-bent on what he sees is, you know, wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would, talking about Indara and, and I think maybe having more, getting to see the full picture of her, there's also a huge moment where Indara, it turns out Indara is the one who killed all the witches uh, when she freed Kelnaka from their spell but i also see that is a tragedy of broken communication not having the full picture because the way i read that scene uh personally is i don't think she had any she was just trying to free kelnaka from a spell from having his agency taken away and i, I didn't read that as she was at all aware that that would murder dozens of witches ken how did you feel about that choice of indara's uh, yeah, no, she she would have have no idea, uh, and and that's that's part of what's going here going on here. The after action report for this incident is going to be pages and pages, and it's going to be <laughs> Jedi unions are going to get involved. It's going to be a mess. But going back to the the May moment, I mean, yeah, Jen, you're right. Everything she said up to this point has been uh, very reason, very big picture, uh, and then the, the 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 it's. I feel like I'm in hot fuzz. I'm a slasher of prices. Wait, what? What did you say for? And, 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 and the sentence didn't complete. <laughs> And May is misquoting her mother. We know this. Uh, and Dara doesn't. Um, they're only going to take it on the surface of, yeah, oh, yeah, this is great. Oh, that essential thing. Yeah, we sacrificed everyone. And I, may, maybe us. I don't know. <laughs> My mom says this. And that is that changes, I think, in that moment, right or wrong. And that's part of what we're debating and discussing here. And Dara looks at Saul like, oh. Oh, okay. Well, that's different. That's new information. Uh, we need to go a little bit uh, closer on that. It springs things forward in action. And as far as what they call knock, I think, yeah, absolutely. And and I want to also say, too, like, whether NSA has got a – she's done a lot of right things. She's done a lot of bad things. That is not the time to turn into mist and start misting your kid. I guess <laughs> that is not the time. <laughs> that is not the time to reach in your pocket and pull out a cell phone. Sorry. Not the time to do it. And I'm not saying that what Saul did was right either, but that's the point, man. I keep tracing this. It's a tornado. This is foobar. Mm -hmm. This is everything that can go wrong has gone wrong because of decisions in the moment. And I think going back to Indara, what else should she do? By the way, one of the great moments we'll talk about. But, they, one of the, you know, what else is she going to do? And it leads to what we think. Uh, I, I still think is the ma mass death of, of the witches, not of Mother Coral, I, I don't think. But, yeah, yeah. And – but – if she knew that, would she not try to save Kanaka or would she try to do it in a different way? We'll never know. We can't mm -hmm. know. You yeah. can't know ever. And also, I think tracking her actions, she there's that flash of concern when uh, May misquotes uh, Mother Anasea, and it sounds like, well, maybe a lot of people are going to be sacrificed. And Dara's mm -hmm. still just like, I'll call the Jedi Council. They said no. Right. And even with that, you know, incorrect knowledge that hey, there might be some sacrificing going on she's still going like, I'm, I'm just, I'm not going to get involved, which mm -hmm. is again, for me, a, another thing that makes me think through all the, the various history of the Jedi of when they get involved and when they don't, and when the audience agrees with them getting involved and not getting involved and all that kind of thing um, is fascinating to me. Uh, one other thing I wanted to mention uh, the, the, uh, a thing that the audience get, didn't get to see also that may didn't mean to start a huge fire is great. Mm hmm information yeah. to have and also says like okay she isn't just a bad seed she's a complicated person she's encouraged by mother coral to use her anger uh and mm -hmm. she burned that jedi symbol and then it started a big fire and she would panicked and, and i think it adds a lot of complexity to may's character so i love that uh final thing for me is i thought there was a lot in this episode about when it is correct for elders parental figures to knowingly withhold knowledge we talked about in dara's uh big choice with uh, uh, withholding that information knowledge from the council and from OSHA. But, you know, Indara has that. I don't want to give information to Torben. I want him to find out for himself. Um, I think it's maybe a problem that May is not clear on what the Ascension is. She just did this ceremony and her parental figures didn't clearly educate her on entirely what it means to take over 
the uh, the coven because she doesn't know. Um, she knows that she wanted to be a witch. She knows she wants the mark. She knows she likes the mark. But when uh, when, when Indara asks her, what does it mean for you to take over? She's like, I don't know. Um, so there's a lot of, I think, throughout this episode, uh, both witch and Jedi elders really choosing when to withhold knowledge from uh, the, the younger people. Ken, do you have any thoughts or feelings about that? I, I do. They're very real world based on experiences. I won't bore anyone with them. But yeah, sometimes I just don't think you need to know and you can't handle it. And then that's me maybe making a choice for you. But it's got your your reaction could interfere with what I got to do. What, what's the bigger picture? And I, I don't fault anyone for that. Um, I think it's a it's a wonderful idea to say, here's all the cards on the table. But it doesn't always work out that way. And I, I, I think uh, um, uh, I would again, I always I'm always going to give the Jedi the benefit of the doubt. I give mm -hmm. Obi-Wan Kenobi the benefit of the <laughs> I do. Um, you yep. know, um, that's... That's always the way I felt, is that Luke could not have handled all that information at that time. Yep. And if Obi-Wan had survived, maybe that would be... So you just blew up the Death Star. Let's sit down and have a conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe at some point, I want to be clear, at some point, maybe yeah, you, you do. Transparency is important, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Jen, any, any thoughts about elders withholding information? That would make sense to me. You only tell kids like really like what they need to know at this moment, because it's such an abstract concept to them that they wouldn't even really be able to process it or it might cause stress and anxiety, which is why you don't want to flood them with all this information. Right. Might be they'll be like, oh, and you're going to have to do this and you're going to have to maybe kill some people. And <laughs> this is what it means to leave. And it's like, what? I didn't know that that was what it involved. Right. You just dole out a little bit at a time and as yeah. they develop and grow older then you share all the all the nasty things that you'll have to do when you become an adult like paying bills <laughs> they there don't even know it. the inside out of you know like getting <laughs> setting up cable and whatever like that just let them worry about it later our yes our big moral takeaway is don't uh, tell your children about spectrum <laughs> or, or comcast right. wait until they can no. handle it emotionally no uh, yes makes a lot of sense uh any uh final thoughts before we take a break on the big picture stuff ken uh no it, it is like i said it is this episode is intentionally complicated but some of the stuff is i think clear in terms of intentions but that's the lesson here uh it's going to be an interesting uh time out there in the discussion world uh and i think that's okay that's mm -hmm. okay but um yeah this is this and also the show is not done yet and that's what's fascinating mm -hmm. to me there's still more clarity to come. There's still more questions to come. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Yeah. Jennifer, any, any final thoughts on the big picture before we take a break? No, every week I side with a different character. So right <laughs> now, Master Soul, I'm, I'm not so thrilled with him. <laughs> I'm not so thrilled. Uh, I'm still Team Witch, which does not seem to waver. Yeah. No, I understand. <laughs> uh, there's there's so so many great things about the story and about their culture. And Mother Anasea is, you know, a powerful figure, great performance. There's so many great things going on there. Uh, I, I think for me, yes, the, I, I just embrace this as a tragedy where m the majority of people had uh, good intentions. I think the the people who escalate uh, a, a lot just in very concentrated moments are, are Torben and Coral. And I also think they're coming from understandable uh fearful and defending what they love uh, yeah. positions. So I, I love that it's uh, complex. It does just so quickly tip into real world. So I just want to be uh, clear as always that we're sharing our opinions, our thoughts. For me, they're absolutely affected by all of my real life experiences and uh, want to be clear always that we are discussing our thoughts and uh, we are always open to everybody having lots of different complicated thoughts, particularly about an episode as complicated as this. Uh, all right, we're going to take a quick break and then we'll talk about some more complicated stuff. Canon, back in a moment. And we are back to continue our discussion. It will be a big one of the Acolyte uh, episode seven. Uh, there's a, a lot of uh, interesting canon stuff and uh, uh, responsible speculation for the future. I um, want to just uh, quickly acknowledge some of the uh, the smaller things. Uh, there's, uh, hey, they're eating Nunas, uh, <laughs> which are little animals that are uh, across the galaxy. So are Nuna common on Brendok or does Kalnaka just travel with lots of raw Nunas to cook? Huge, huge canon question there. Uh, we have the uh, the kind of Wookiee callback line where Indara says it's unwise uh, to uh, insult a Wookiee's cooking, which calls back Han Solo's line. It's not wise to upset a Wookiee. Jennifer, I wanted to be sure to ask you 
uh, your question about that as a is a Wookiee fan. Is this just common parlance in the galaxy where uh, everybody always says it's not wise to fill in the blank a Wookiee? <laughs> I think it is definitely common knowledge. You just don't upset, insult, uh, you know, anger a Wookiee in any way. I mean, any per if I were to see a Wookiee in real life, I would just know that. It's like poking a bear. I'm not going to do it. <laughs> yep. Good. Ken, how did you feel about that uh, little bit of a callback line? It's great. Uh, also, you know, I love Wookiees. Love Wookiees. A little grumpy. A little grumpy. A little on edge. <laughs> no one likes that friend. Like, don't, oh, don't say that to them. Don't say that to them. They'll rip your That's they, You know, maybe Wookiees got to work on that. Also, I, I think uh, he's hunting there. Maybe there's some frozen prepackaged Nunas on the way. But they're there seven weeks or so, they said at the time. Mm -hmm. He's got a hunt. He does bring Wookiee cookies. That's confirmed in my head. Yes. <laughs> uh, lovely. Yes. I, I love the idea that that's just common parlance throughout the galaxy of, you know, it is not wise to whistle in front of a Wookiee. They don't like it. It's high pitches. Bother them. Um, the planet that uh, Torben is from, Bonadon, is uh, originally from the Han Solo's uh, Legends book, uh, which is a cool little name check. Uh, we got uh, M count once again, which we talked about. It has, you know, important uh, relevance to May and Osha's identity and what the Jedi think about them and the actions they take. Uh, but not even Torben. <laughs> we'll just say the full word. Uh, Ken, how did you feel like yet another M count instead of the full word of midi chlorian count? I don't, I don't love conspiracy theories, but now I do want to dig into the conspiracy theory that that word's been stricken from the star wars record in in house you know <laughs> there was a time when that monster vince mcmahon ran wwe and he wouldn't let you say things like belt or wrestling or wrestling move mm. couldn't say it, it was banned company-wide uh, i'm gonna put this dangerously put this conspiracy theory out there that they don't want to say many glorious which is um silly they should say it but yeah at least it's consistent yeah uh, Asajj Ventress had the courage to say the full word in Bad Batch recently. But besides that, it's all been M count recently. Jennifer, do you care at all whether they say M count or midi chlorian count? My brain actually just filled in midichlorian count. But you know what's funny? <laughs> maybe, maybe George Lucas has, well, not with Asajj Ventress, but maybe George Lucas has a license on it, a trademark on it, where they have to pay him a certain <laughs> amount of money every time somebody says midichlorian. That would be mm, amazing if he... George. Just out of total petty anger to some of the cruel response to Phantom Menace, he was like, Disney, I will sell you all of Star Wars except the word midi-chlorian, which I will get $5 every time somebody says. I'll yeah, give you McClunky for free, but I'm taking midi-chlorian. <laughs> well, and maybe that maybe we're misunderstanding this. Maybe this is Ocean Maid's McClunky count, and yeah. <laughs> it's not midi-chlorians at be. all. Uh, the Night Sisters name check, uh, where they're saying, hey, there might be witches. And uh, Torben says, uh, Night Sisters, Kalnaka seems kind of creeped out. We're, like, mm -hmm, <laughs> We're mm -hmm. concerned. Uh, there was a quote about Night Sisters don't raise younglings. Uh, Jen, uh, you love the Night Sisters. How did you feel about the name check and the kind of acknowledgement that the Jedi are very aware of that a group of witches? I loved it. I wrote it down. Night sisters don't raise younglings. I was like, yes, all right. And I just thought, yeah, this is just, this show is just fantastic. Just, hmm. I love it. I love it. Uh, Ken, any thoughts on the Night Sisters name check? Uh, now, wait a minute. Is it that they don't raise younglings or it's like they don't raise younglings? They raise warriors. Like, is, is this just a fact? I didn't know this. I didn't follow this. I don't follow the Night Sisters uh, too closely, uh, though I love them. Uh, no, it's, it's fine. It also was good. That's a little exposition right there handled in a very nice way. Like, oh, yeah. Night Sisters? Oh, these are not. These are something different. Thank you, guys. Yep. Yep. I really like that. Uh, it was uh, acknowledged and included uh, the hyperspace disaster that was referenced right at the beginning that uh, this planet was uh, charted 100 years ago, or this system is being uh, dead from a hyperspace disaster 100 years ago, I believe is a reference to the... Uh, the instigating event of the High Republic publishing initiative, massive hyperspace disaster uh, that the Jedi heroically mitigate, but many planets are still and systems are still damaged. Ken, how did you did you interpret it that way, and how did you feel about it? Yeah, it, it is what it is, and and, and and a thousand book fans screamed in joy. I could feel it mm -hmm. on the uh, on the internet, and uh, and I did as well. Um, only because not not just because of hey, that's a thing I read, but just like what? Yeah, it's a pretty big thing in history. And we can't go back and insert that into Return of the Jedi <laughs> or, mm -hmm. or Empire Strikes Back. But I like that it would be mentioned going forward in storytelling. Yeah, for me, I loved it because it, it was a Leonardo DiCaprio point at the screen. I read that. I know that. But 
more importantly, it was world building. And it's that kind of world building yeah. that says these momentous events that happen in publishing, you know, echo out through all of Star Wars and they matter. And mm -hmm. I thought that was really cool. Uh, some of the uh, bigger picture stuff, uh, the virgins. Um, there, the dialogue is very careful to talk about the that the virgins is around places because the, mm. the Jedi and the Phantom Menace are kind of like shocked at Qui Gon's theory that a virgins would be centered around Anakin as a person. Uh, mm. For for the uh, the cannon hounds out there, uh, but Jennifer, how did you? I kind of took it that the cauldron that the witches are. Uh, performing ceremonies over is is the virgins on the planet. Uh, I tended to believe the Jedi's theory that the witches manipulated that great power to make Osha in May in some way. Um, Saul says early on a virgins could create life like what we see on this planet, meaning all of the, you know, uh, the, the plants and the Nunas, uh, but also mm -hmm. maybe Osha in May. How did you take all the virgins, st virgins stuff and what do you think about it? This was something where I was like, crap, I don't have time to research. This. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing research and other stuff. But it was one of those moments where I was like, boy, this is the fun of being a Star Wars fan because I can watch this show and I can have, you know, a general knowledge of it, right? Or you can have no knowledge of this, but it still makes sense. And if you want to take the time to dive deeper, you can, which you guys will do right now for me. Uh, but I liked that they said, yeah, that, that it was centered around. Uh, or that it was made clear, centered around the location, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, I didn't take it as necessarily the cauldron. I took it as like their little fortress area that that mm. was kind of like, I don't know, but I, I'm probably misreading that. Oh, I Gentlemen, don't think take over. <laughs> I, yeah, I would, th that's a total interpretation. I don't think there's something in the episode or there's no like secret Wikipedia article. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> that what I mean. It's like, the cauldron. I just kind of feel like it's the cauldron because of the way we see them. Uh, having ceremonies around it. Um, it Ken, sense. how did you feel about the the virgins of it all in Ocean May's birth and all that? Yeah, no, Jen, I'm actually more on your side of things. I hear it. I know where it's mentioned in other places. I think you're right, Joseph. I think either that cauldron or that, that, that hole that leads down to something and we don't fully understand it. That to me is one of those things like, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, magic. Cool. Let's keep going. And I don't, but I also want to be clear. I, I think... Whatever, whatever Mother Anasea did to create this one consciousness put into two or these twins, whatever, it wasn't necessarily to me a natural use of the virgins, right? Virgins just didn't go, boo, and all suddenly twins are out. Uh, and I think that's the biggest difference between what's going on with Anakin and what's going on with this. And that's why we don't have the whole picture. Mm -hmm. um, but for me, it's just, I, I, I don't mean this dismissively. It's like, oh, cool, magic. Uh, I, I don't understand it. It's there. Let's go on. Yeah let's, yeah, let's figure out what the result is. Yeah, yeah. For me, I like you, you, yeah. There are Wikipedia articles and Wikipedia articles, and you can dive deep and get technical and list all the places that are virgins. But for me, it's just, it's a it's a storytelling thing. It's the yes, the 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 force is the, this thing created by all living beings. It is the living force. It is the cosmic force. And there's these moments where it's concentrated. And in, in and to me, it's yes. just a metaphor for like there are places in life where power is concentrated, and yeah. different people choose to use it respectfully or or maybe use it unnaturally or do you cross your boundaries in order to protect it are you uh, who in life doesn't want to sometimes isn't tempted to get closer to power f for their own uh, aggrandizement like mm -hmm. to me mm -hmm. it's just a great magic m metaphor yep. and yep. i feel like that's its purpose and i feel like this is a great one where like if you want to dive in and compare it to anakin and the dagoba tree great deep dive and go nuts but i also feel like you do not need to have ever heard that word before to be on board with what's happening in this show. Agreed. Yeah, I'll watch the videos that they that are put out of that. I absolutely will. Um, yes. But it's like, are the are the nine rings of power supposed to be nuclear weapon? No, they're they maybe whatever you want. They're power and how you use it. It's, mm -hmm. it's the quest. Yeah. 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 And uh, and yeah, we'll we'll see with the with the Anakin thing. Yes, lots of people were very uh, st strongly opinionated that the force created Anakin naturally that is you know uh, i think uh, the majority of people's take and i feel like a different story is being told with ocean and may and we don't yes. have the entire story and we might not it might just be yes the jedi believe this who knows uh, mm -hmm. all right let's talk uh, a little bit about the future uh coral lives so uh i we don't see what happens to coral in this particular episode i don't believe we saw her corpse 
lying around in episode three, to my knowledge. Uh, it could be mistaken there. I didn't have time to scrub through every frame of, of episode three. Um, so, uh, Jennifer, what is your fun, responsible speculation? Are we going to see Coral again? Does a part of her live on in Kalnaka? <laughs> is it Mother Coral, you know, writing all those uh, things on the wall in his in his in Kalnaka's hut? Uh, does Kalnaka, in, in fact, contain the spirit of all the witches? Did they not die? Did they all just live on buried in Kalnaka? And if so, did come here killed? <laughs> so those are some of the places my mind went. How are you feeling about Coral? Ooh, that's a that's a lot. Yeah, I you know, I honestly did not want to believe that the witches are dead. Maybe it's my own denial, but it just felt like such a and not want to say anticlimactic moment, but I was like, come on, give them a better death scene than just huh. So uh I'm gonna believe that they're still alive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It might in Jennifer's child. Sure. And she, on it. She's asking for <laughs> peanut butter and jelly. Uh, I, I will want get that, that in a moment. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So, yeah. So, I don't believe that they're dead. I believe that Coral is still alive. And if we get a season two, we will see her there. I think it'd be too much for her to appear in the last episode. It'd be like, ha ha. Mm -hmm. And I'm here. And, you know, Chimera is here. And the whole gang is back. It just feels like a, <laughs> a bit much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I um, definitely want to touch yeah. in on that big picture question of, how much is going to happen in this uh, last episode and how long is it going to be? Uh, Ken, what are your choral thoughts, hopes, dreams, fantasies? Uh, it's, uh, in, yeah, it's 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 a journey. It's a journey. I got to tell you, it's a journey. And I, I'm kind of there for all of it. I, Jen, I, I'm with you. I, I, I've been saying that the witches are dead, but even the way it happened there, I'm like, uh, maybe, maybe not. Um, I love what you're putting forth, Joseph, of of the witches or at least just coral living on in some way in Kalnaka, almost like it's the, what is it? 1984, uh, Lily Tomlin, Steve Martin movie, all of me. Like we got, <laughs> we got that going on. We, we can have that uh, rom-com adventure series with them. I, I, I hinted at it earlier, but like I, I, I had kind of, I jumped up and was like, Oh, Oh, coral is Chimere and it's mm. all witchery. And it's all, then I was like, then I replayed the, the, the bathtub scene from last week. And I was like, well, that would be awkward. I don't know about that. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> you got to consider ah, the bigger picture like this episode says. But I, I do think there's something going on. But the big thing that I land on is how much pressure do we want to put on one final episode for a show that we don't know is confirmed yet? Uh, at the time of writing and making it, I definitely don't think it'd be confirmed. Rain Roberts had a kind of vague, we're preparing for a second season. But as we've seen with the streaming world these days, that is not a guarantee. Um, and and I, I think it was even somewhat of a battle to, to get Ahsoka uh, season two, um, you know, for, for big business reasons. But uh, so I, I don't know how much pressure I want to put on the final episode. So, Jen, I agree with you. Mask comes off. Ha ha. That, if that happens, that might be it. And we don't get more and we have a lot more questions or it's someone completely different. She's gone. We never see her again. It could be everything. But I, I don't think we're done with Mother Coral. Yeah, it has become a tactic of some streaming shows to end on the most frustrating cliffhanger humanly possible for basically just, hey, fans, put pressure on the powers that be to renew this. I don't think Star Wars has quite... <laughs> got to that point is some, you know, more independent uh, productions because it's part of this uh -huh. much larger tapestry. But I also want to be aware that, you know, trends affect Star Wars. It's not, you know, entirely isolated. Yeah. So I am also open to the fact that, hey, some some really intriguing things could have been put in by the, the writers to be like, fans, wouldn't you like to know what happened to Mother Coral? I don't think that is beyond the realm of possibility, given that it is a, a trend that is happening in yeah. uh, the the battle between creators and the powers that be. Yep. The, the, mo the most tragic one recently for me was the sh series Willow, a series I came to really appreciate mm -hmm. ends with like a book. One's on the shelf. We got two more, <sighs> literally a shot of books on a shelf and it was casted and team going. Yeah. Yeah. And Bob Chappick and team went, nah. Well, I would look I that up. They also that. nuked that from existing. <sighs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, so just to kind of to, to round out that conversation about uh, second season, um, here here was my estimation of the things that will would most likely be resolved in this final episode uh, in order for the season to feel somewhat complete, like it's a complete story, right? Um, Osha's relationship to the Force has been a, a big thing since season since episode one, when she couldn't call Pip her hand to save herself on the prison ship. Even in this episode, we have one of the witches saying the girl has yet to discover the power she holds. 
a huge part of last episode was Chimere trying to get her in touch with how incredibly powerful she is. So that big question of Osha's own relationship to the Force. Osha and May's relationship has to come to some sort of next level, uh, uh, next chapter, turning the page. Osha and Saul have to have a relationship uh, reckoning that uh, that Saul did not tell her the whole truth. Um, maybe we'll get the answers. I think we certainly need Chimere's fate. Like what happens to him? Does he escape and live to fight another day? Does he die? Does he turn out to be a Claudite who, <laughs> uh, shapeshifter, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. whatever your theory is. Um, uh, but also fans have been so wanting the entire uh, show, even before it was actually on streaming was, what's the answer to the Sith question? How does he mm -hmm. fit into the Sith lineage? Uh, we also have uh, Senator Raincourt's Jedi investigation and how Vernestra is going to handle it. Um, we also get have the how is the truth of the Sith going to be erased, either uh, erased uh, because everybody who knows about it died, uh, hidden by choice, um, reported but disbelieved and put in a secret Jedi warehouse like that whole. Those are the questions to me that feel like maybe some of them could lean in toward in toward the the ellipsis of and we'll answer more in second season but a mm -hmm. lot of those things i feel like some version of them need to happen for narrative completion so mm -hmm. ken what do you think about that list and what do you think about the odds that there's a second season announcement the second after the final episode airs i i think that that's a great list of of the things that that again we we say need to be answered we'll put quotation marks around it that yeah. uh we maybe want to be answered or would seem like they would be answered and i think those are the correct ones to look at more than just the information like i don't i don't know if this is going to end with the final shot being darth tenebris arise like, it yeah. doesn't seem like that's what's going on but the questions about the sith and the information i think need to be dealt with as far as the second season <clears throat> i know a lot of people think uh uh, you know, we've got a new animation announcement coming soon. That's just because of rumors, and that's just because of wants and desires on the internet. I want it too. I want to find out. I don't think we're going to get the and then season two announcement. I think I think we'll I think we'll I think it's going to happen. How about I say this? I do think we'll get a second season. I just don't I don't think we're going to know for a bit. Mm -hmm. I Marvel and Star Wars don't always uh, share the same playbook at all. But I am affected by by the first season of Loki that, you know, ended on a cliffhanger and they made it OK by saying, don't worry, Loki, season two is coming immediately. Right. So I think for, for myself, in terms of just how my approaching is, there are some things that I would want, like relationships don't need to be resolved, but but they need to be addressed, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So there's a, a side of me of like, uh, I would be OK if this is a wide open cliffhanger as long as we get that second season yeah. announcement if not i want some of these things to be kind of brought to a little bit of a conclusion with then a looking toward the future of what's the next chapter mm, yeah i agree jennifer do you have any thoughts about a second season or how much you're hoping gets resolved in this final episode I want a second season. I don't know business-wise if we are going to get a second season. I don't know if this was a gigantic hit like The Mandalorian was, um, or even like the thought process with behind Andor, why that was, you know, greenlit for a second season. Uh, I think that a lot of people would like a second season, but again, that's a business question. I think Leslie Headland was very clear saying that she put everything on the table with this season, with this series, knowing that she may not get a second season. So I think, I hope we're going to get a lot of the questions that you that you poised answered. Um, it better be an hour-long episode, though, because there is a lot on that <laughs> wish list uh -huh. that we want to know, right? And I do mm -hmm. think that there, there are going to be some cliffhangers, but it will still be satisfying, where if we get a second season, great, and if we don't, we can still be happy with how this series resolved. Mm -hmm. Yeah, th I think that's a really great point about that Leslie Headling uh, quote, which I had uh, forgot, which gives me some hope for, you know, I, I feel like this episode is intended to be, and I could be wrong, it's my interpretation, that uh, this is Soul telling May, hey, you know a lot of this, but here's my perspective about why I did it. And I think it's going to be him on his hands and knees because a lot of the choices we talked about are murky or they are based on half information the big choice he made and the one that seems to haunt him the most based on his dialogue in the show is choosing to save osha and letting may go that's the one that seems to be he said so many times in the show 
I wish I could have saved you both or I couldn't save you before. Let me save you now uh, to May. Um, I think this this episode uh, it, to me is representing he has communicated a lot to May. Uh, I think Osha in the helmet might have perceived some of this in her own sort of reckoning. So I, I'm kind of hoping that the last episode can start pretty quickly with a lot of this information has come out. We get Osha, May, Saul, Chimere in the same place. And then a lot of these relationship ideas can be resolved. And that's the most important thing to me. If if there's still like a fun mystery about where's Coral or a fun question hanging over how Chimere fits into the Sith line, I'd be okay with that. I just really want the main emotional threads of those four characters getting in a room and hashing it out to, to happen. Agreed. All right. We always like to share a couple of uh, favorite moments. I know we're going long, so we can uh, keep this uh, a little bit shorter if need be. So, Jennifer, did you have any specific favorite moments that you wanted to highlight? Kalnaka fight sequence. I was thrilled that we got that because we were all a little disappointed that we did not get that when we saw him dead. So uh, forgive my pronunciation. Jonas Swadamo? Swadamo, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. If he was in the suit, whoever was in the suit. Fantastic. That is so incredibly difficult to move in that way and being so dynamic in that gigantic fursuit. Bravo. <laughs> it was just fun, too. It's just one of those moments where I'm like, this is why I love Star Wars. It's fun. It's weird. It's a Wookiee with a lightsaber jumping through the air. Um, but my biggest favorite moment, which I just remembered after you mentioning it, Osha in the helmet. That was fantastic to get her breathing and mm. then the transformation of the breath. Cause we've always heard Vader breathing, right? Like that kind of like uh, breath this mm -hmm. menacing breath and hers is like fear to then like evolving to like calm. I don't know. It was fantastic. And I just love getting that, that visual of the, her, her perspective looking out. Um, that was really great. Yeah, yeah, we didn't get a chance. I, I wish we had more time to discuss all sorts of details uh, from last week's episode. But yeah, that was... Wait, was that fantastic. last week's episode? Oh my no, gosh, it was the last, week. last week's episode. You guys, I'm so sorry I took <laughs> us on that tangent. It's because I watched them back to back. And that yeah, episode really stuck with me for a variety of reasons, which I won't even get into. I'm a married woman. Anyways, talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> talk about cliffhangers. <laughs> If people write in, there will be a second season of Jennifer explains what she means about her marriage. <laughs> no, I, I, was I'm looking at, I'm I was joking. looking respectfully at Chimere. Oh my goodness, that no, there was, yeah. was a heated moment. I'm like, Star Wars is getting sexy. Wow, we thought that like the Kylo Ren sequence in, in the Last Jedi I was like, woo, Star Wars is really pushing boundaries. This, there were so many moments where I'm like, are we gonna? Are we gonna get a butt shot? Like, what is this? Is this Game of Thrones? This isn't HBO. This is Disney Plus. Yeah, no, we we really wish. Uh, I totally understand that you couldn't, but we really wish you could have joined us for that last episode. We had a lot of fun talking about how much Kymir put that on the table of desire, it's sexuality, more than sexuality, but also like that was on the table. It's for the uh, best. I forgot my daughter's here. She has her headphones on. Continue. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Ken. Did you have a, a couple of favorite moments? Look, Jen, I watch Paramore videos because I really enjoy uh, the music. Grace understands. Uh, look, here's the thing. Uh, yeah, I loved, I loved, I mentioned already, I loved the possession of Torben scene. I, I loved everything about it. I love the questions and what she's selling. And and, and I, I almost to the point of I, I don't want to be a jerk. I don't want to be an a-hole. I, I have been craving some different choices from actors in Star Wars for the last couple of years. Jody Turner-Smith and Carrie Ann Moss in this episode and E. Young Jay, uh, Jung Jay, um, absolutely just brought it in a way that I've been kind of missing, um, for a while. And, and, uh, since, since Andor, I'll just say, and, and, and <clears throat> it just, I, I watched him a couple of times. Those, just those scenes, just some of the stuff, just, just Carrie Ann Moss, um, making the choices here, the energy's here. And it's just, um, it was, I needed it. I, I won't go <laughs> too far down the path. I needed it. And I got it from those two, those three performers this week. Yeah. Uh, really agree. It's the, the, the possession seduction of Torben, I thought was fantastic from the acting perspective, both actors involved, but I also feel like um, it, it was just really well directed to make you feel what Torben is feeling. Um, and, and, and the more I think about what, what makes something well directed to mean in directing is everything from speaking to the actors and guiding the actors to, uh, 
making shot choices to making editing choices. And for me, what it's about is, do you feel what the characters are feeling? Because that's how we connect deeply. And I thought this did such a great job of making you feel like Torben, like who wouldn't say yes <laughs> to that? Mm -hmm. Like, I'll give you what you need. Just, mm -hmm. you know, you're not getting what you need. Don't, and you should have what you need. So incredibly well done. The, the voice coming at him from every angle and then the sharp cut to the kneel in the, in the fierceness mm -hmm. of it beautiful um a couple other moments for me that agree the kalnaka fight um i think that moment of seeing him backlit with the kind of weird head of just the playing the horror and the weird pulpy fun of uh oh possessed wookie <laughs> not gonna go well for anyone so that was a great uh, shot that was a great it, shot right yeah, wasn't it yeah. um and yeah. uh, uh soul's huge leap over him it, it's horrible but seeing how messed up torben's face got from a, a, a wookie claw hand push uh, mm -hmm, awful mm -hmm. Um, but just a great fight, uh, emotionally visceral. Um, a couple of moments of dialogue I really enjoyed. Uh, I liked uh, Karen Moss's delivery talking about the witches of like, we should leave them alone. They are so insular, so strange. <laughs> yeah, that was yeah. also like, that would be, that should be on the cover of a you know paperback from the 40s. Witches, so insular, so strange. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I don't agree with it, but I also like Torben's utter fear when he's like, that, this is the line I was mentioning before. There's something dangerous about those women. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is total, totally also like, you know, uh, mm -hmm. the paranoia, the fear that's baked into witch narratives of mm -hmm. how people react to women having power is like so baked into the dangerous about those women. Um, yep. final, final moment for me is um, I really felt soul's pain. Uh, after he, he's every every time we see him for the most part he's been so good at de-escalating so good at not igniting that blade and, and to me it, it was, it's worse than what luke did when he ignited the blade uh in front of kylo but it had that same spirit of like i'm i normally make the better choice in the one time i didn't it is catastrophically awful and so i mm -hmm. love that scene of him just being despondent and just kind of defending himself up to a point but letting uh coral pummel him and refusing to fight and like just what a great visceral way to show the horror and the guilt and the knowledge of how badly uh he screwed up um final thing on that like I, you know uh, i really wanted a, a, a fresh perspective on all the on 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 soul so when the episode was over i asked my wife how do you feel uh, about all of soul's choices and she's like think i feel bad about it as bad about it as soul does <laughs> which i thought was a, a great summary of uh of how uh how aware he is of uh some of his uh failures all right moving on uh was there anything you disliked or questioned in this episode ken uh no i thought there was a a a, a an improvement on on uh episode three in terms of direction and editing that, that episode i actually had some, some some bigger issues on the choices the shots the setting the the, the blocking uh, this maybe it was because it was an incomplete episode and done from mm. a certain point of view. Um, I didn't have a lot of that in this episode, so it's not something I dislike. I just want to highlight. I want to go back and say I had issues with something before, and and like you were pointing out, Joseph, I think this this was a, a, a way more complete effort. And that, again, I want to acknowledge. I think maybe that was part of what was going on. Obviously, mm -hmm. uh, so that's that. No, um, I like that we had more episodes. I, I I'm gonna you know we're, I think I'm done bringing up the business talk too much uh, these days, but like. There's a conversation to be had about minutes and what's are allowed on streaming and what what the inconsistencies are. And we got a little bit of insight from that writer saying, well, we had we, this one. Episode four had to end here and we had to use those minutes elsewhere kind of, kind of thing. And we don't know the whole picture and I don't care to know. I just I just liked that this episode had a little bit more time. And so you asked me what I disliked. I'm trying to highlight again what I liked because <laughs> there's been things in the past that I've kind of questioned or disliked about the sh how these shows uh, had to be put together. And this one um, surpassed all that for me. I agree. And, and for me, maybe it's minutes. I don't think it's minutes. I think it's more about uh, ideas. Does it feel like a complete idea, a complete thought? Mm -hmm. And this episode felt like such a complete thought. So I really, yep. really like that. Uh, Jennifer, is there anything you uh, disliked or struggled with? I do agree that this show could have benefited for maybe a couple more episodes just for my own selfish reasons, because I just like being with these characters. I like that they took that moment with a uh, soul where he's just on the, on the ship, just really wrestling with everything mm -hmm. that's happening. I was like, Oh, bravo to the director for just letting it linger. So we can really get inside his head because a lot of mm -hmm. times, you know, they're moving fast. Um, I think that this, this episode could have benefited for me personally with a little bit more of understanding Torben's motivation. 
motivation mm. in terms of how he was feeling. Why did he want to go back to Coruscant? Yeah, he's bored, but I would just like just a sentence, a little bit more, a scene. I don't know. Um, that's just my own personal thing. I think it, it paid off just fine, but I don't know. Again, I just I'm selfish. I want to see all these moments with these actors because they're mm-hmm. also great. Yeah, it definitely makes me want to know more about Torben of like, does he want to go home because he's bored? Does does is he incredibly lonely? And th- that difference between like, is he afraid? Does this does he you know? There's been some great Jedi in the in the High Republic who don't want to travel because they're like, I like libraries. I prefer to stay in a library. Yeah, yeah. and I, yeah, it'd be fun to get more depth on Torben. But what what was there at work for me? Uh, final thing I, I want to talk about quickly because I think it's going to be a, a long conversation is there was a very different choice of. Um, uh, playing a modern pop song at the end, uh, mm. the the power of two. Um, I will say my opinion, and I love uh, both of yours. Um, I-, I love the song. I think it's a great song. And I, uh, if uh, if they were taking a poll, I would vote for them to do it because I think Star Wars should try new things. I think for myself, ultimately, I like Star Wars feeling a little bit more separated from the real world. I like going into the fantasy world. And going right from the sort of fantasy mythic into a modern pop song is a struggle for me, even though I really like the song and really like that they're trying new things because I think they should. So I, for me, it was it was mixed. But I did like because apparently that song, the, the, the credits didn't minimize to try to get you to watch a different show because of that song. <laughs> So I'm yes, glad that I didn't have to fight <laughs> the cursor or the remote <laughs> on Disney Plus. So I, that's also a vote in favor. So Ken, did you have any thoughts or feelings about this very different choice? I'm glad you mentioned it. I had forgot. Uh, I want to say I have no problem with the song's existence. I think the lyrics. I was trying to listen a little bit. It seems great. obviously very uh, connected to what's going on. Maybe even some clues. I'm half joking there. I I like how you phrased it, Joseph. Uh, they made an artistic decision to try to do something different. That doesn't mean it's always going to land. And I'm absolutely being a hypocrite here. I didn't enjoy it uh, being used as an end credit song. It took me out of Star Wars. But I, I'm a hypocrite because there's been three or four times where Game of Thrones did it. But that was the Hold Steady covering an in-show song. That was mm. Florence and, and, and the Machine covering an in-show song. Um, that was a little different feel. But I liked Willow. No one can see it, as you pointed out. Willow ended each episode with a modern cover of a classic song, and people hated it, but I liked it. <laughs> I liked it because it it was the vibe of the show, and it worked for me. But I mm. but again, art, artists make a choice. We I stand on stage and make a choice. You let me know if it worked or not in that moment. And, and for me, this one, I, I'm glad you brought it up. But actually, I, I, it took me out of it a little bit. Yeah, Soul has that line quite, you know, toward the end. I had to make a choice, and uh, mm-hmm. I, I'm sure everybody who uh, <laughs> made this choice is the make same a choice. Had to make the, a choice. The song, the song itself yeah. isn't the problem. The artist yep. behind it, not the problem. Mm-mm. Not even the I, choice. I it's love the song. I'll probably download it. it the the mm-hmm. song is great. It's it, for me. It's about that. Um, how quickly do I get plunged into the real world in the very modern world with a with a modern pop song? Uh, Jennifer, how did you feel about it? I loved it. I was well, the thing about it though. I think that people are responding to is like with Willow, like you said, Ken, like I loved that they did that, but they did it from right. the get go. Yeah. Right. Yeah. They mm. kind of established the tone of what to expect. And mm-hmm. I actually started listening to songs, the originals after that show, because it reminded me of certain sequences or certain episodes. Yeah. Mm. This, I really liked. Uh, I felt like it was expressing something. It was extension of what was being expressed into the show. Uh, so I liked that. I do wish that they might maybe had saved it for the finale. Mm. I think it could have been more impactful. Or why not just do that from the get-go? That could have been really fun and, and it makes sense that it would be a departure for Star Wars. I don't know, to try something new because this show has been so many new things. So mm-hmm. I like it, but I think people might have responded better if it was done a little differently. Mm, yeah, the all episodes or final episode is very interesting because then it does give it a kind of a different uh, significance. Yeah, fascinating. Uh, well, there's our nuanced opinions, much like <laughs> the entire show of uh, of uh, this new choice in Star Wars. Is there anything we haven't talked about that you wanted to touch on, Ken? All good. Laid it on the table today. Uh, how about you, Jennifer? I can't even think. Except, oh, there was one moment with uh, Vernestra Rowe uh, when uh, her uh, the gentleman or the person was saying, uh, what was it? You don't like going to the Outer Rim. You find it unsettling. You get nauseous. 
Oh yeah, was that the previous episode? Yeah. Was that the previous yes, that episode? That was the previous episode. Gosh dang it! <laughs> it's All fine. right, I'm just gonna stop you missed, now. You missed last week. You, you you're getting a yeah, chance to say what you it's like. Great. It's all good. I'm sorry. All right. All good. No. Anyways, all that's good. it. That's good. We covered it all for me. We covered it all and some uh, some bonus from the previous episode, which is great. And if we could record longer, uh, we would ask Jennifer a lot of questions about various thoughts uh, on the previous episode. Uh, final thing for me, I just I really enjoyed this episode. I think it was a, a hard episode in a way a tragedy should be. I think my yes. heart broke yes. seven different times and i fully own that any uh, opinions or analysis i have are i'm trying to respond to the text but i think i think art is a conversation and i think we all bring ourselves to the conversation and so we're trying to analyze the text but we're also uh, the beauty of art we get to analyze ourselves as well in question why does this moment mean this to me why am i reacting strongly to this moment so again just want to emphasize that this is a, a challenging episode, and I think a lot of people are going to have a lot of different opinions and want to be sure that we're always a friendly place for people to have different uh, perspectives and different takes. Uh, final fun question. Jennifer, if you could have a figure of merch from, uh, of any character idea from this episode or last episode, what would you want? I have it from this episode, and I forgot to mention. This was my thing I wanted to share. I want it on a T-shirt. Right now, I choose Mother. Mm. Oh, that was so great. And it's actually very true to what's happening right now. My child yeah. wants me to make her a sandwich. <laughs> right now, I'm uh, going to have to choose mother. Uh, Ken, do you do you want a right now? I choose mother uh, T-shirt. I absolutely want that for Jen and for all the mothers in the world. Yeah, I'll take that. Now, you know, I'm not collecting figures anymore, but a uh, Kalnaka with lightsaber out and witch possessed eyes would be pretty good. Yep. Yep. Uh, give me a, a battle damage Torben, <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm a happy camper. Uh, yep. The, and maybe a virgins, an actual real life virgins. For like maybe it's a has lab that you can you know yeah you crowdfund a, a real life virgins that would be great all right that is our big episode about this big complicated episode ken do you want to take us home yeah we're four center and we can be found on social media at four center pod facebook page is four center podcast we're instagram youtube so hey subscribe here hit that notification bell we we'll get the live stream coming up on july 12 2 p.m pacific we're gonna talk about the end of acolyte and what it might be and mean uh you can get merch at t public t public.com slash user slash four center podcast available everywhere just search you'll find us if not let us know we'll try to add it and you can support us directly at patreon.com slash four center follow me at ken knapsack go to my website ken knapsack.com jen where can they find you and Go make that sandwich. <laughs> you can find me on most of the social media sites at Jennifer Landa or TikTok at Jennifer Landa 1138. There you go. Good stuff, Joseph. Take us home. you got a lot going on. Yeah, you can go to my website, josephscrimshaw.com, for updates on when our short horror film, The Nightmare Adorable, will be playing. It's got a couple more screenings coming up in the next month or so. You can also uh, check out the birthday show I'm doing. Ken's going to be on it as well. It's called uh, Horror Years Old. It's happening Friday, August 16th. And you can live stream it from anywhere in the world if you want. So that's on my website, josephscrimshaw.com. Uh, speaking of choices, uh, I also want to uh, highlight a project that means a lot to me called Vote Forward. It is something where you write nonpartisan letters encouraging people to just use their power and go vote. If that's something that you are interested in getting involved in and reading about, the website is votefwd.org. That is it. This has been The Acolyte Report.